Oh, greetings. 2016, Zeph Report first on the trail, or one of the early birds anyway. Uh, wow. We, on the one hand, the glass is half full, we got here. On the other hand, there's another year of Barack Obama and his socialist revolutionary policies while spending $470,000 a day, $70 million so far on lavishing vacations while <clears throat> most people are unemployed. And that's the truth, most people are. It's beyond the 50% point. It's like 50% unemployment. And he claims to have it at 5%. I mean, that's the way they roll, lies. So the, it's been so bad that, um, and now most of what I've said about the economy is starting to show up, you know, about the state of things, is showing up in the stock market, worst performance since 2008. Um, interesting statistic. Uh, you're going to find that most of these, you know, you can run from the truth for a while, but eventually it's going to come out. You can run from the truth and make this a propaganda president and prop him up endlessly. Like he's the, he's really got it down to 5%. He saved the economy and all this other stuff. When everybody really knows it's the worst it's ever been because of him and the people that support him, represent him, work with him, etc. because of them. The human suffering that they have created by their proxy wars is the same as any war. Young men, young women, innocent people dying, not knowing why they lived, confusion in their eyes, not knowing, you know, why they have to die so that we can keep this little junket going for our dictator. My God, my God, is there no humanity? I happen to think these people in power now obviously hate themselves, and to, but they hate humanity to an extent that is, even I couldn't uh, imagine having been through their evil, you know, been through the, the, the uh, scourge of uh, society's hammer. Even I could not even imagine how they could hate that much. And they're celebrating because they want to get to the point where the USA cannot have air conditioners and things like that, or houses more than 200 square feet, while they build bigger ones. And uh, they're the worst thing. They are the, they are the aristocrats in Les Miserables. You know? They are the, uh, the um, shallow, indecent, perverted... Uh, Wealthy class. The ones that they enlarge since they're running the movies, they make movies about themselves being the evil despot kings, pretending to care about other people in their liberal policies and ideology, but then in personal practice, worse than everybody by a huge margin. That just gives you some idea of why a Donald Trump, despite all the people saying, oh, it won't last, it's because people know what I'm telling you, and they're just damned angry. They're so angry, in fact, they're one click from a shooting war, but then Obama wants a shooting war so he can crush the states, crush the rebellion, and playing Lincoln while he goes off and plays golf. One big ha 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 fantasy against you, against you and you and you, all of you. Against you liberals, against all who put him in power. He really is the problem. And he's even plotting on staying. In other words, your vote, your will, you know, if he can find a way to get the guns and round you up, I think he'd be very happy with a nuclear war where we all just get killed.
Now, <laughs> the people that would talk such things and, you know, before Obama came in and the dangers there and the people that warned the prophetic voices out there, you all underestimated him. He's worse than what you said when you said Antichrist. He's worse than the composite of the Antichrist than what is described in the Bible. He's worse. He's actually worse. He wants the will of the people to be angered and outraged so they might do something so he, he can then strike back and have his civil war. That's why it's important we do not give it to him. So you're so angry out there, you're going to take it out. In the, and, and by the way, Ted Cruz cannot win. So those of you who are for Ted Cruz, he cannot win. And if oh, they may not let Trump win because they rig the, uh, the polls and the booths, you know, they rig them all. And uh, well, not all, but I mean, they rig enough so they can, you know, tip it if they have to. And then, of course, Trump's life is in danger as well. And so I know you're praying for him, and I thank you for that. I uh, seldom see someone, you know, touched by God, chosen by God. You know, those of us in the spiritual realm who have eyes in the spirit, we see that he was chosen. I'm not sure whether it's to be president or whether to just shake this whole thing up, but he's shaking it. And, uh, boy, he scares the hell out of them, and they just have to get rid of him. I've never seen anyone so candid on the public stage about, you know, say, 9-11. You know, that flying the Saudis outbid. The, I don't know about you, but those are, those are war words. Uh, he's saying, you know, uh, George W. Bush and the Bush family, you are the enemy. What are you going to do about it? He's, he's, and they were like head of the CIA and, you know, very powerful. And he's saying, you know, I'm, I'm calling out on this one thing, but guess what? I know all the rest of it, too. That's what he said in that statement. He, he, he's like, I'm not going to play ball. And so they're, they're, the, the Bush family's survival is at stake if they don't get Trump out of the way. Well, reputation, law, what if they tied a bunch of stuff to them? I'm not saying what it would be. I, I don't know what, but let's say they tied collusion to all these false flags and all this other stuff. I mean... When Obama needs a false flag, he just picks up his, <laughs> his cell phone and dials a few numbers, right? And then there is one that he goes out and says, I'm getting the guns. All this flurry of false flags right before the guns. And then he takes the gun. I mean, this is ruthless. This is cruel. This is disgusting. This is, this is, this is pure evil. But make no mistake, qui bono? Obama, the gun grabbers. That's who benefits from these false flags. How many people died in Connecticut of the year of the Sandy Hook shootings? According to the death records, zero. The death rate by murder, etc., shooting, all that stuff, zero. Official record. I, I'm not kidding you. It's zero. Uh, well, th th those we call hoaxes and the false flags are where you have, <clears throat> you know, the, where they run the operation, but real people get killed, unfortunately, innocent people dead so that Obama can have his gun control and his lavish vacations. And it's just, it's, it's just really, if you see it from my perspective, you know, which most people do actually, it's really, really bad. It's really evil. The world's really evil. It would be very hard if you know what I know to have a good day. Things are so bad, it's impossible to just, <clears throat> you know, go watch a Star Wars or a, go to a Disneyland or do something like that. Those days are over and they're never coming back again. Those innocent days of, of just enjoying life and having an ice cream cone and going to the park and, you know, seeing children play, it's all ruined now. All I see are the children. When I see, I look in their eyes, I see death. When I see people hoping for a better year, like on Fox News, I saw the, the five sitting there all talking about what they thought the next year would bring and being positive. And I thought, wow, these people really don't know what's going on. They're so compartmentalized. And they're, they're talking about a better year and better things. And I'm hoping too, in a way. But 
I, I just felt sad when I, when I saw that. And I look across the landscape of the, of the earth, I see people want a reason to feel positive. They're, they're, they're begging for a reason to feel positive about things. They've, they know the way the world is. They see the senseless death and destruction, and they worry, have we Americans been the cause of evil in this world? They're just beginning to get to that point. I don't have the heart to tell them all the things we've done. I don't have the heart to tell them all the things that we've done in the name of a few fat cats and their parties and their fun. It's so far beyond all the allegories like the Maze Runner and the different things where the dead prey on the living. It's so far beyond the zombie movies and, 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 and vampire movies. It's so far beyond that in terms of evil that it cannot be described in this podcast. Because if we were to get down to the roots of it, it's so bad and so ugly that no one dare want to look upon it. No one dare want to admit it. We can't. It's just too much to have on all of our hands. Oh, how do we ever clean up? How do we ever hold our heads up without shame? How can any of us say we've done well? How can any, any human being upon the earth say we as humanity have done well? <clears throat> and many who are past the point of cynicism, who believe there is no hope, but are partying on into the end in a nihilistic manner, I suppose they might even think that if we had a nuclear war, it would be the most humane thing to do. Clear out as many as you can. Send them on home. But you see the problem, ladies and gentlemen, is I know a little something about the spiritual realm after death. Yes, I know a little something about what happens after death, and they don't go home, folks. They don't go home. You might go home. Those of you in Jesus Christ, you're going home. But they don't. At least not yet. And that may be the evilest thing of all. All the people that feel they're going to have this paradise or this a better life upon death. No. Your troubles just begin when you die. Avoid death like the plague, ladies and gentlemen, unless you're right with the Lord. Because if you die in your sin... You have no idea what hell is. You have no idea what suffering is. You have no idea what evil is, but you're going to find out. There are consequences to failing in this life. I'm just going to say it one more time, and I'll let you interpret it. There are consequences to failing to actually just do the, the right thing, the logical thing in this life, which is to figure it out. Not to just run around and take the little breadcrumbs they throw you and have your little stupid job they give you and have your 2.5 kids and 2.5 cars and chicken in every pot and all that crap. Um, you're supposed to figure it out. Suffering is usually the way that brings about figuring it out. So if they can keep you anesthetized and decadent, they figure you'll never figure it out and you'll die on cue. Meanwhile, they're killing you. And you're, you're, and you're loving them. And that's a broad brush, yes. As it should be a broad brush, because that's what it literally is in terms of numbers. So I want to add something. Now, I'm not here to just, you know, talk, it's so bad, blah, blah, blah. We can see that if you watch the film network. It's so bad, it's beyond bad, he says, you know. And uh, the, the famous rant, Peter Finch at Network. Um, so I watched The Man of La Mancha, you know, the, 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 the Broadway play that was a big hit. For MGM made it into a musical, <clears throat> um, a musical, a movie musical. 
It's a musical about Don Quixote. Now, I understand I'm obsessed with Don Quixote. With the whole story, what it says about humanity, you know, the need to bring him back, to play that evil game on him, to... I understand very well. There's gang stalking in Don Quixote, the story. I recommend it. Well, the movie versions have all kind of failed. I think we have to just go with a... If you don't read Spanish, which you probably don't, then we have to go with a, a, uh, with a, a good interpretation, a good translation of the Cervantes classic. But it's... Uh, uh, he nailed it, man. Anyway, this was about the author Cervantes, a playwright and an actor, uh, being brought in by the Inquisition and thrown into a dungeon. And then he decides to put on a play with the people in the dungeon that have been tormented and routed up by the Inquisition to go ahead and um, mount a defense in his behalf to save a manuscript that they're about to throw out, probably Don Quixote. And uh, yeah, the errant knight, knight of the fierce countenance. And uh, so they, uh, he starts mounting his defense by telling the story of Don Quixote. And the whole point of it, there was a part in the film that departs from the book and from the, from the general story, where Peter O'Toole played the man for, of La Mancha, he played Don Quixote, which I thought he did an okay job, but I mean, he's not really the best singer, but I, I enjoyed seeing Sophia Loren, uh, what a beauty she was, and how different women's figures were back then. She, she was, you wouldn't say plump, but she definitely had a figure, you know what I mean, as opposed to what happened with uh, the unisex skinny bodies. She never became that, but here she was acting, singing, you know, and they all were. But, it, you know, Peter O'Toole's okay at the singing. I, I you know, I, I don't know really what to think. I, I felt that he play, he overplayed it a bit. He played a bit too, that Don Quixote, I, I didn't quite, a lot of times I was jarred out of my, um, out of the story by his acting. So I, I'm not sure that was a good fit. Probably not, you know. But, you know, it's all subject to interpretation. My Don Quixote is a little different than Peter O'Toole would do. He, he played it like he was so frail and such a bumbling fool. And I felt that he overplayed that whoever directed it or wrote it. You guys, well, they're dead now, but you all overplayed it. You, you didn't have to be. He's already a fool in the sense that he's going out to save the damsel in distress. He's going out to do the right thing. He's on a quest for a better world. And deemed, of course, mad by everybody, completely crazy. And um, mad because he wants to see a better world. Mad because he wants to undo the evil of the world. Mad because he wants to take the bullies of the world and stick it to them and free the captives. Mad because he wants to fight evil. Mad because he wants to behave in a manner that is, that is, that is virtuous, that is becoming a knight of a knight. And um, with all the virtues and all the features that um, one has come to expect from noble knights. Now, of course, we all know they probably weren't like that, but I mean, he had, there were, this was a story that took place when there were no more knights. And he had his trusty sidekick, Sancho, who was, uh, always plays a sort of roly-poly Spanish character that is his uh, valet. So he's a knight with his valet going out to fight the great evil, and to fight the evil demons. And there's a, there's a knight out there that's uh, the enchanter, and he's really evil. And he needs to go st to resolve this conflict or fight to a duel, fight to a death, and hopefully win with the enchanter and free the, the land to goodness rather than evil. Because the enchanter, through obviously evil spells and witchcraft and black magic, has kept everybody in a state of bondage. And so Don Quixote, whoever he is, he sets out on his journey with Sancho. So they're doing a play in this prison 
of the Inquisition, and then you start seeing the the literal part of the play, what they're putting on in the little prison now goes outside like you're in a dream world, you know, and you see the actual story unfolding. The same one you've seen in various movies, I'm sure, because they've done it a few times. Well, it's never been really what I imagined from the you know, reading of it, and I, I tried to find it. I think we have it in storage somewhere, but I'm, I have an illustrated version of it, which would really be cool. The illustrated version is all you need. But anyway, you know, this is, and, and, and the virtues of the night echo all the virtues of the Bible. You know, they, are, they echo the virtue of what a good man is. And when, I'm not saying we had perfect men in the Bible. We didn't. We had scoundrels and murderers and liars, and they became the heroes of God, where, you know, which is, which is, that makes me just love the Bible so much more just because it's so, you know, when I'm thinking that, I'm thinking, okay, David, okay, Matthew, all right, you know, um, John, um, you know, all these guys, you know, John's calling for people's deaths if they, don't, if they diss Jesus, you know, and early on. Becomes a lot of time. They all change over time. The Bible allows them to not be these kind of comic book superheroes that don't have any, any arc. They're just heroes and that's it. No, they go through a, 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 a you know, a, a period. Peter certainly was one of the best examples of a, a majorly flawed, murderous, violent human being. And they all had traits like that. You know, Abraham wasn't quite up to snuff. And, and you know, Moses didn't quite make it. And, and you know, the... They they uh, they struggled with obedience, you know, uh, and struggled to 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 do what the Lord was saying. And sometimes they just they couldn't, you know. They were on this quest. All of them, though, were on this quest, a quest that was such a threat to the world, a quest for life, that obviously was such a threat to the world that many of these people were put down in death because they dared to try. To make it a better world, obviously. They dared to try to find the truth. They dared to live. They dared to love. They dared to risk in order to find something, to find the truth, to serve the Lord, to try to, to find out what the Lord wants and try to, f try to make it a better place, try to make it a better, a better world anyway. And they all paid the price because any quest to make things a better world, any quest to love, to life, any quest to be of virtue, to be of service, to be honest, to be not perverted, not living a double life, to be pure of heart, to be at one with the Lord, any quest like that is met with, you had better be a knight and quite skilled in your profession of defense and offense because now you have an enemy, the world. The world will not tolerate a Don Quixote who sees, uh, you know, what's her name, Adonza, who is a whore, you know, and she's working, and if the men have any money, she'll have sex with them that come through to the tavern or the little place where they come for rest and for a room and, and for food. And, uh, you know, she will, she, she will do that. And she's the maid and she's everything else. Anyway, she, and she's beautiful. Don Quixote only sees her as Dulcinea, the sweet, beautiful one, the, the, the queen of virtue, that, that he as a knight would serve her and go out and conquer the lands so it would be a better place for her and people like her. And he would not lay a hand on her. It, it was just to be, to be in her presence was uh, filled his heart with joy and the fact that she approved of, of his knighthood and what he was doing for her was the, 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 the fulfillment uh, of everything, um, not expecting anything more than just to um, have respect. There was one line that said to have respect for, for men and women, you know, that he would not allow lust to come into his heart and to, to, to corrupt him toward her in any way, but it would be pure. And uh, he is seeing her as this uh, Dulcinea, this, this, this virginal queen, whatever. 
it eventually had an effect on her. She eventually felt, had a feeling of self-esteem because, you know, not just this horrible thing with these horrible men and all men want the same thing and it's all lousy and it's just, you know, there's nothing more than this. We're just born, I think what they say, we're born as maggots on, on, the, on, this, uh, on this earth to just suffer and die. That's what she said. We're just born here as maggots. You're starting to think, well, this must be a pretty heavy play. It's an MGM musical, folks. An MGM musical. And look at all the, uh, look at all the truth that comes out of it. I mean, you don't get that today. Nothing like it. Finally, the reason I bring it up is because in this particular movie of the Battle of La Mancha, the dialogue they had for Peter O'Toole was where he said, you know, he had been a young man in battle. He'd seen, and I just said this, but I've been wrapping it up here. He'd seen people, young men die of total confusion in their eyes. And he said something outside of the Zeff report. They die not knowing why they even lived. That's the sad tragedy of this world. This world is so evil and so bad, so completely horrible. If you have eyes to see, there is no good. It's just all darkness and no light. And that's what the movie is about, about people who were having that mentality back then in Cervantes' time. They're having the same feeling about the world and humanity that you all have because they know about the Inquisition and they, they know about the putting innocent people to death and burning them at the stake and finding young people that are innocent and claiming that they are with the devil and killing them and stoning them and hurting them and all the manner of things we've seen and the, the beheadings and the atrocities and the, and the corruption on Wall Street and the corruption and with Obama and the lavishing himself and the psychological torture and warfare and the poisoning of the food and the poisoning of the environment and the complete disregard and disrespect for that beauty thing, that beauteous thing that God has made. How awful these rulers are who crap on the earth and, and, and then they shut down some power plants thinking they're doing something for Mother Earth when they hate the earth to death. Mm. Oh, whoa, whoa, double, double, have it both ways, huh? And when you finally get your mind around that, you see it's so bad that all you want to do is die. All you really want to do is die, but for the young ones, but for your marriage and your kids, you don't. But you wish you could because your eyes have seen too much and you can't put the eyes back in the socket. You've, you've, you've been through too many. You've been at the brunt of their evil and you know what they're capable of. You know these jackals that have taken over the governments. You know what they'll do if God, if God doesn't intervene. And he is, and he is, and he is. I'm going to tell you all about it. Had he not, we wouldn't be here. But my God, we could, we could live such a better life, a life in harmony of, but that requires being like Don Quixote, which the world would never tolerate. A man of virtue, a man of honor, a man of principle, a man of love. I mean the agape love that has respect for all human beings, even the enemies that you would slay, you would treat their wounds. They even had that part in it. My God. The upshot of it all, in this little gem of truth is that Don Quixote makes the speech as Cervantes, you know, not putting the play on, but off, off the stage. And he says, you know, he's seen, you know, war and he's seen the suffering. Like I say, he's seen people die not even knowing why they live. They die with the people die not having some great purpose of a war, but with nothing but confusion of their eyes. Uh, famine and plagues and, and, and enforced starvation of other people and, and the stealing of things they have and the, the lack of virtue and the cheapening of the flesh. Oh, yes. All the flesh was cheapened like it was when we were in high school. You know? Having orgasms is just like going to the bathroom. You know, it's on that level. Everything's like going to the bathroom. By the time you're 16... Now, by the time you're eight, five, and nothing but darkness and shrouds while these people go off 
popping off, Obama does, playing his golf, enjoying his luxury vacations. Now, I'm not against capitalism. I've been on plenty of luxury vacations and luxuries myself, but not like that. It's, there's a difference. Not on someone else's dime like that. People that don't have two sticks to rub together in some cases. I think that may be the ugliest thing I have seen. I mean, as bad as the drones and all the collateral damage and the destruction of innocent people that this government has done, the idea of this $470 million a day vacation, eh, where the expense account, there is an expense account, I think it's like 19000 for vacations and, you know, it's some nominal amount, but I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's just gross. It's, it's actually, it's, it's disgusting. It's, 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 it's no, no human being should ever have to witness that because unless they were completely mind controlled and hypnotized. Someone saying that this is the best president of my lifetime and this is the best America can be. They're satisfied with this. I will show you people whose hearts have been destroyed, who are pure darkness and pure evil. There is no redeeming quality in them. And they shall not be redeemed by the Lord or anybody else. They have satisfied with their lot, and this is what they wanted, and this is what they get. And my advice to you all, who think this is the greatest president, the greatest thing that you could have, you better be satisfied with it, and you better never die. Oh boy, you better never die because you're going to have a rude awakening. Now at the same time, if Don Quixote were here in America today, the first thing he would do is go confront the president. The evil blah, blah, blah. As gentlemen to hash it out for the souls of America. I mean, that would be the way he would approach it. What we have instead is Donald Trump, who has been, as Cervantes was, on the world side. No, no, uh, no, no lack of street smarts there with, with either one. But this madness of Don Quixote to believe in the impossible dream, as the song, you know, the famous song that's in the Man of La Mancha musical. To, um, to write the unwritable wrong, or whatever, however they say it. To, um, you know, to, to go at evil, to conquer evil, to, to create good, no matter what the odds. To stand on principle and to be of service and to see people in a good light with respect, no matter what the odds, no matter how. And this is a time of disrespect. I mean, if you look on Twitter, well, I probably won't go to Twitter anymore. I mean, I have some friends there, and it's nice to talk to them. But, you know, I have to be subjected to all these tweets that are so disgusting and disrespectful. And I've been disrespectful, too, and I have to repent on it. And I'm going to for 2016. See, I came away from the man of La Mancha, Don Quixote de la Mancha, okay? So I came away from that with, with a little bit different attitude. Like, like, not that he's mad, but that we all need to be Don Quixote. We all need to have mutual respect. And, you know, I found myself slipping into the Muslims are all evil and all that. And I, and I you know, that's, that's obviously completely wrong. I mean, we cannot <clears throat> give up on anybody. No matter what horror show they show us to, they're obviously showing me all these atrocities to get me to think that way. That's what they want me to think. Then they try to shame me for thinking the way they want me to think. It's just, it's a terrible, t it's, 
This is worse than my, my mother with multiple personalities. On the one hand, you get mommy dearest. The next minute, you get this beautiful, beneficent, lovely mother, and it switches. It was hard for my brother and me. You know, he didn't end for my father, but we didn't understand it. You know what I mean? How one minute it's one thing. And, and I, you know, I mean, people accuse me of the same thing. I probably have some traits of the same thing. I, I don't think so now, but I mean, I know I did back then. It's difficult to have understanding. Especially when someone says, come on in. Enjoy yourself. The water is fine. And then, you know, it becomes a death trap. You know, that's what the Nazis would do. That's what the, well, we trust, you know. We trust our mothers. We trust, we trust the world. We trust them inviting us in thinking, oh, good. We're getting a, a, a nice time here. And it's really just a death trap. You know, we've, we've seen all this. It's maximum evil. So we see Don Quixote going out and, uh, you know, as an errant knight to right the wrongs of this world, to, to crush the evil. And his family needs him because he's the rich uncle to a niece that's plotting against him, actually, with her future husband and others. And they want to create a game to psychologically traumatize him through gang stalking. Yes, I said gang stalking. Him back home where he could be kept, an eye kept on him because he needs to write a will that will favor his niece. So far they believe that the fortune goes to the niece. He's wealthy. He's a gentleman. He's educated, and he has a home <clears throat> and, a, and, a, and a farm, I think, and cattle and things. He's, he's, he's uh, gone off on a fugue as Don Quixote without a penny to his, in his pocket. But he belongs to somewhere where he is someone of a landowner, and he does have something to pass on to his niece, niece the only family he has left. It's important for them, because he's a cash cow, isn't he, to get him back home and make him sign some things to make sure they get everything upon his death. And perhaps in some way he was becoming Don Quixote to escape the evil of these people plotting against him, just salivating at the idea that he would die and they would get his fortune and they would have his house and have his things that he has. So he went off on this quest to, to do the impossible, to, 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 to rid the world of evil, because obviously he'd seen enough, because he'd been a soldier, he'd been poor, he'd been wealthy, he'd been everything, he'd seen everything. And his response is this, I've seen everything the way it is, I've seen life trash like garbage. I've seen the world as nothing but a, a, a lousy place. Like they said in the play, nothing but maggots. We're born as maggots just to die in the hot sun, struggling, suffering. And he says, you know, the world is so horrible. It's so absolutely horrible. What's wrong? with instead of seeing it the way it is, seeing it the way it should be, instead, and living accordingly. And then it, it's so funny because it taught me something. I had this, I said, yes, that's what the, the Matrix is. It's like Disneyland. It's, we're given this mind control that the world's a good place. You know, as it should be. You know, cops doing their job and, you know, you know, just good versus evil and evil loses, you know, like the movies. We're given that on the television and, you know, through our programming. We're seeing the world as it should be. <clears throat> Why not see it as it should be rather than what it is? It begs the question. 
And he makes a good point, and that's really the cry of the movie. What's wrong with seeing it the way it should be rather than the way it is? That's why I became Don Quixote. To do the right thing against impossible odds. To do the right thing even though everyone else is doing wrong. To stand firm for the Lord even though everybody else out the back door, beyond closed doors, is going with the Satan thing, pretending on Sunday to be equal to you, being with the Lord, when they're not like you at all. Rather, they say they're of the Lord, they say they're Christians, they say they're Jews, but are not, you know, that line. Well, it goes the same thing for Christians. They say they're Christians, but are not. But why not be the real deal? And they'll tell you. I mean, I had one church tell me, one pastor, he said, you know, at our church, you know, we, we know the way the world works, so we're, we're not, you know. Well, why aren't you not? You know. You know the way the world works, so it's cool. You can bring them in for Jesus, you liar. And it's cool with Jesus because we know the way the world works, so you know. No, there is no you know with me. That's wrong. You know, I know, you are not saved, never were, asshole. Get out of my face. I'll fight you to the end, to the end, and I will win every time I win, every time, and every time you lose. But you have the illusion of winning, and I have the illusion of losing to contend with. I have the mocking, laughing, scornful, awful people and you have applause. Well, okay. But really, we both know what's really right. It should be the opposite. So I will continue to see it, like Don Quixote, for what it is. I'm sorry to use that word. Don Quixote would never use the word asshole. He would have much more respect than that. You see, I've been, I've told you I'm not one to follow. Look, I just slipped my tongue. Well, you know, you've, you pay me the big bucks to be undone a little bit, but at the same time, I have, to, I have to show you a better me, and I will. That's what I think in 2016. We're just going to become better people. And for me, that might mean not cussing, you know? I think that's a good thing to start off right. That's an easy, that's an easy fix. That's an easy one. Not to become a hypocrite, but just as a point of virtue, recognizing that tongue, tongue can do good, but it can do massively evil things, and just recognizing that fact. Being careful with that tongue when it slips out saying, you know, I know we all get uh, tired and angry, and we spout off, you know. I mean, I just was on a semi-tirade about the president. I, you know, ultimately, I do pray for the president. I encourage you to do the same. You know, God, it's, it's a spiritual thing. God can change this. But having to be subjected to it all, and then having seen Don Quixote, I realized, my God, I, you're right. I don't want to see the world as so cynical to look at the president's bill and the, all the info on social networks about all the lies we've been fed and the horrible life we live here. Rather, I would like to see the glass is half full. <clears throat> I would like to see progress be made in, in, in the hearts and minds of people rather than systems, than corporations, than, than, than you know, nebulous science or whatever they, however they make themselves feel better. I would rather see us as individuals come up. And the only way we can come up is our hearts need to be pure. Our intentions pure, our motives pure. And yes, they would laugh at you if you were out on a, a date with a girl, let's say for you young people, or maybe not so young in some cases. And you know, you don't just maul her. You don't put your hands all over her. <clears throat> she might laugh at you and go, what are you, Don Quixote, being in the time of chivalry? I want it, give it to me. Oh no. My lady, I can see it now, the scene. You know, there's, there's respect, there's decorum, there's, there's a way a man and a woman should behave. 
there's, <clears throat> there's a beauty to it. There's a dance. What the heck ever happened to that, folks? That respect. That's what I'm talking about. It doesn't have to be like it is now. Now look at the example we've given our children. They're, they sexed each other. Oh, well, every kid's done it. They send nude photos of each other through, through Twitter. I think this is all a psyop. Don't you agree? To break down the morals, who benefits? The satanic people, the, uh, the Satanists that were running things. You know, the communist takeover, whatever. You know, the dictatorship, the totalitarian state, as Brother Thomas put it. They benefit from our lack of decorum. They benefit from our lack of respect. They benefit from our yelling at each other on Twitter. They benefit. We all lose. So I think Gandhi was, was it that said, you know, be the change you want to see. And I, boy, I'll tell you, there's, that's, a, that's a piece of wisdom that will always... Oh, Jesus has said the same thing in so many words, you know, and don't bring that against your brother unless you got the plank out of your own eye. Isn't that a similar thing? Well, we have to work on ourselves is what I'm saying today. You know, it just takes one Don Quixote to change a whole landscape of people. One person, one pure heart. One, what does it say about pure hearts in the Bible? A pure, to the pure, all things are pure. Yeah, but blessed are the pure hearts for they shall, what? See God. See God. Unless your heart is pure, ladies and gentlemen, you will not see God. Unless my heart, I can't go around all cynical, although I've, I've been doing that and I apologize. Well, it's, it's tough. You know, to see so many people suffering and to not get angry, it's tough. To see innocent people slaughtered for no reason except their faith, it's tough. To see wanton disregard for life, to see the president cynically before the so, so-called dead bodies, which half the time there aren't any, uh, are even cold. He's out campaigning for gun control. I mean, it, 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 it makes you so sick, so sick, 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 deep, sick, and having sick, oh, ouch. And then to see people nodding their heads up and down like that was the right thing to do. To see him aiding and abetting racism and divisions between people while lavishing himself endlessly while everybody loses their opportunities and loses their economic futures. How he takes a victory lap after victory lap with each level of destruction that he brings. I tell you, at the same time that I pray for this man, there is no greater thing that a people could do than overthrow this evil dictator. There is no greater thing that a man could do in this world, in this life, on this earth, in this century or any other century than overthrow this evil dictator who believes he's entitled to be president for life. Oh, you haven't seen that yet, but that's, that's coming next. Don't know how they're gonna pull that off, but that's, you think they're just going to have it be a Donald Trump against Hillary Clinton, winner take all? To have this man who believes he should be president for life, not just for another term, but for life, like a Hugo Chavez or something like that. And the, the, the fact that you might go along with it, if he can get your guns, he will do that. There's no greater task that the world, including the United Nations or anybody else, or any other country has, but removing Barack Obama. He is the greatest blight to every country there is on this earth that has ever been in any capacity of leadership ever. I don't care what they say. He is the face of pure evil. He is what Daniel talked about uh, just before the forever kingdom of the wicked king whose God was the God of forces. Notice how Obama is obsessed with Star Wars. Oh, yeah. He uses the God of forces. 
a strange God his fathers knew not. Not Allah, a form of Satan, yes, but the, the, the God of forces. Harnessing the force, well, it's witchcraft, of course, but it's harnessing the force of the life force, the force of the, of the world, of magnetism, whatever. He's been prophesied about. I don't know that I could call him the Antichrist or literal thing. I'm, I'm not sure how that all works. I just know that, um, that getting him out of office before the nuclear war would be a good idea if you value any life at all. Now, there are <clears throat> people working against him in high places. You know, the, you, you know we're in World War III already. With the, well, I don't know what else to say other than that. I mean, I've never seen, you know, I went back to Nixon. I'm thinking, well, he did wrong and everything, and they were corrupt, and they had the good old boy backroom cigar smoking thing going on. But it was just nothing compared to the way it is. To, I mean, this is just a blatant disregard for everything, the whole rule of law with no consequences. And I'm always amazed now there's no consequences with this man. But, I mean, he's the greatest threat to Europe already, as you can see, his and their, their I mean, you know, it's him and it's, it's, yes, he's a puppet, but he's also in with the club. I mean, the club brings the migrants in to conquer Germany. You know, he's responsible for that. I mean, and so are other world leaders. I understand. Merkel's as bad as, as him. Okay. So perhaps, but anyway, there's a way to think about these things. And like I say, as Don Quixote would think about it, we need to directly, he would say this, <clears throat> we need to mount a challenge and to, in a reasonable and respectful way, argue out our ideas publicly so the public can see. A more cynical person would say, no, it's war. Let's have at it. But then that cynical person would always say it's war. Would always want to have at it. The man of virtue would say, you know, even though he's cheating and they're cheating and they're lying, I'm going to remain honest. I'm going to remain truthful. I'm going to do it the right way. And that's what I think I'd like to see. You know, I want to see, I am a pure heart. You know, and, and I, whatever dark coloring of my heart that there was from the world, it's not my corruption. I don't want it there. I want to see the good in people. I want to see hope for 2016. I want to see that we go about things the right way. I don't want to just assume what I don't know. If I have a prophecy or something that's different or a word or whatever that's different. But... I don't want to just assume the worst. Well, what I'm saying is, I don't want to just say Obama, but the program that Obama represents, there's no greater threat to the freedom of humanity than that, and that, so that's why I say it must be overthrown. But that in saying that, there are, there, there's, there, there's the way to do that that is the right way, and then there's the wrong way, because if you just start going at it and do what they do, then it's bad against bad. Who cares then? It's, everything's wrecked. You see, it's just, it's gotten to such a horrible point. Yes, I can understand there are some people who are very cynical who are thinking nuclear war would be humane. I, I understand that. But I don't think God's going to let that happen unless God wants it to happen. God has held back all the destruction that should have come. We should already have nuclear war, but we didn't. So, you know, but never has there been a greater threat of nuclear war than now. And that's why I say that there's no greater task than overthrowing, you know, than throwing, I should say overthrowing, because that sounds like a coup. No, the coup has to be legal. It's, it's like then throwing out the bad guys. Because there's never been a greater danger of nuclear war, meaning for our survival, the greatest thing we will ever do is to throw this regime, which is represented all over the world, which is headed up by Obama, the most powerful man in the world, obviously, to throw it out so that we don't die in a nuclear war. I, I'm going to just cut to the chase like that. I may mean, put it that way. There's no greater thing you could do for humanity's survival than put strong leadership 
in your country, especially in the United States. There's no greater, put another way, there's no greater danger to humanity in the world than a weakened United States nuclear power. Now put it that way. Than a wounded, bleeding and dying United States of America is the worst thing for the future of humanity because it means mass death. So there's no greater thing humanity could do for its own survival, I don't care what country you're from, than removing this regime from the United States. Otherwise, billions of you will die. That's what I mean to say, without, without getting into this personal stuff. See, Don Quixote has taught me, he's taught me to have respect for that enemy. To even be willing to treat that enemy as wounds should we do battle. That is the uh, Christian thing to do as well. That is the way that our soldiers are in Christ, are in Christ. It's that attitude of that knight errant, it's that decorum, it's that virtue, it's that, it's that exactly that gives the victory in battle. That faith and that, and that pureness of heart in battle where one could get very cynical, especially where all your friends have faces like spaghetti after they get blown off, they get blown away, and then just see the whole thing as evil and awful and go on a killing spree. It's easy to do that. Much harder to, you know, probably impossible <clears throat> to go at it the right way. But, you know, Vietnam was a bunch of hotheads going every different direction with no real good leadership. And look how that wound up. Same thing with Iraq and everything else. No, leadership, respect, self-respect. To know that you're not just a mistake here. You're not just some speck of dust at the far end of the universe that doesn't matter to anyone. No, what you think and what you believe and what you do all matters. This idea, well, what's the use? It doesn't matter anyway. This is cynicism. You see, this is what we must battle against. This is a greater enemy than, than an Obama administration intent on transforming the world into his communist paradise. You know, th this is um, a greater problem is within ourselves. Hey, Trish, could I, should I publish this? I mean, I ranked on Obama and I just, that was terrible. It's valid, but it's like, what about us? You know, I mean, aren't we, isn't he just a reflection of us in a way? Don't we need to clean our own acts up? Of course we do. Of course we do. The reason they protect Obama in the way they do, and they don't all, they're not all on the same mind on that, you know, on not, not the protection, but on, on, on Obama's legitimacy, is even though there's no birth certificate, there's no records, there's no anything, is because they are on in the communist revolution. They are all revolutionaries and of, of like mind, and that's why they protect him, and that's why there's no rule of law anymore. 2015 saw the end of the rule of law completely and a bunch of other rights as well and other things. I'm just struggling here to not be cynical, folks. I don't want to be like that. I, you see, they win the minute I become cynical, I, I, that I say we're just maggots upon the earth waiting to die. The minute I go there for real in my heart, my heart is broken and ruined and how could it be that if I have Christ? How can it be that if I have the light? How can I be, you know, how could it be? And then if I go over to mindless Disneyland and start playing like a kid, like everything's cool in my own little bubble, I lose. The Lord wants me to have my eyes open at the same time, be a pure heart. Well, the only one I know that's done that is Jesus. And then the other one is Don Quixote. And you know, he was so mad, they considered him insane.
He would never play ball with a Satanist. He's, he, would, he, would, he would be a virtue. He would do the right thing. If they're all going to get down and whatever they're going to do, <clears throat> he would, you know, he would oppose it. They would call him crazy because they all want to have fun and drink and grab the girls and do whatever they're going to do. I mean, I'm going back to the heterosexual times back then, but I'm sure half of them are gay. I mean, it doesn't matter, but, you know, the theater is a theater after all. Be a foolish to people to think that there aren't gay people in the arts. <laughs> but the Jews, don't worry, it's the Jews that run things. Well, Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, they were Jews, yes. I had met the mayor through my grandfather when I was just a boy, you know, a handshake, whatever. Louis B., they called him. Yep. Or Louis, or whatever. I say more power to them, you know, thank God they made the movies. I mean, this movie really touched me, this MGM musical, Metro Goldwyn Mayer. Yeah. The famous MGM musical. It really got deep. It was really, I can't believe it actually. I mean, there were real ideas in this. There was, there was real substance to this, even more so than just the book. They added some things. They had some things in there that were quite amazing. Now, the singing, and stuff was, you know, it was okay. The music was not a bad mix, you know, pretty good for an old restoration and HD treatment of it. But um, I really got a kick out of seeing Sophia Loren sing. I didn't know she, she can't really sing too well, but she did a really good job. It was just great seeing her. I don't know what, something about her that just, you know, that you know, uh, that, that just really was something, the way she was fighting all the men off, you know, and, and, and her change of heart and as to what happened uh, in his transformation and that evil trick they played on him of taking the madman and breaking him back down and bringing him back home and his spirit was crushed. His madness was simply wanting to, he couldn't take it anymore, he snapped, yes. Well, what I meant to say, which I didn't, I was, you know, you know, I don't want to give fuel to the fire. People, you know, thinking that through violence or through any kind of, you know, counter-revolution, they can, they can right the wrong of, say, a Barack Obama or whatever else. I'm a, I do not, I'm not in that camp and I probably never will be. I'm, I'm more for doing things the right way, even if they do it the wrong way. That's what the Don Quixote, I've always been like that. I've, Folks, I've, people that know me, they know I've always been, you know, even if you crap on me, I'm not going to take vengeance on you. You know what I mean? I'm going to take it to the Lord. And the vengeance be the Lord's. I've just always been like that. I've been in fights <clears throat> before when I was a boy where a guy, I remember a guy was punching me over and over again. I wouldn't hit him back. I could have hit him back. I've been a champion in boxer when I was a kid. And I, I boxed. When I boxed, I'd have to box two people at once because... I could beat the crap out of anybody. And, and I was, you know, in the ring where it's legal, I was just insane. A fighter. But outside the ring, like in this case, I wouldn't hit him back. Because something made me stand down. I started crying, a member eventually, and he stopped hitting me. But then he was perplexed. Why didn't he hit me back? Because, I mean, I'm, I'm a tough kid. You know, I, I would get in a scrap. I would fight back, but I didn't in this case. Probably that saved this man's, this young man's life, I think. It showed him something. It showed me something. And I think I'd do it again. You know, in other words, there's a right way and a wrong way to fight. You want to go in the ring and go at it? Let's, let's have a duel? Let, okay, that makes sense. Do it honorably. But this, this sneaking up and hitting someone, you know, it's... Uh, you know, just be, being a bully, <laughs> that kind of thing. Oh, there's two schools of thought. One, of course, if there was someone to defend, I suppose I would have hit back. But I didn't. I didn't hit back. Now, what was my feeling afterward? Did I hold a grudge? No, I didn't hold a grudge. But 
It only happened once. See, the world's way is violent. The, you know, the, the, the way of this country and every other country is violence. The world's way is war. The world's way is, is uh, quid pro quo love. You know, you do this for me, I'll do that for you, making everyone a prostitute. The way of the world is ugliness. The way of the world is, is tragedy, but we create this matrix of Disneyland to tell ourselves we're, we're not so bad, we're pretty good. Life is sweet. Of course, for the winners. The world has always been <clears throat> existing and you know, doing well at the expense of other people. Doing well to the extent of how, many, how much blood sacrifice there has been. It's just a conundrum of life that is that you cannot solve. And if your eyes are open to it, you will become quite cynical and even world-weary and then even laughing at wars and destruction of other people and your own. Wondering even why God would put life here in the first place. He must be an awfully sadistic, psychopathic creature to put us here just to suffer with no, with most people dying without knowing why they lived. I mean, what's the point, Lord, in making people live if they just die confused? What, what is the point? What is the point? And it's, the point is to become Don Quixote, despite it all, to become children. Not world weary, not cynical. And the way you do that is by beginning that you have self respect, but furthermore, respect for other people. Now, this, this thing about this knight, he was frail and clumsy, falling all the time, but willing to get up and fight, and even if he bumbled it every time, willing to make that fight. It's all the more impossible for him because he was an old man and feeble. They're not able to, you know, really fight the windmill. The windmill basically beat him. But it's the idea that he would keep that attitude and keep trying. And everyone said, he's mad as a loon. What do we do? What do we do? And most of them say, well, just humor him. Just, you know, he's Don Quixote. Give him his respect. And slowly that virtue, that self-respect of Don Quixote, that, that world view that he had, that way of treating people that he did, transformed others. Not everyone, but others had a Christ-like experience through one person being a virtue, one person standing up and saying, this is the right thing, this is what we must do. This is what I will do as a knight, errant, I will stand my ground. I will fight to free these people. I will make sure the evil whatever doesn't get them. And that's my duty. And if I die in that process, it's okay. I die for the right thing. This is the right thing to do to fight off the evil. Because when we go with evil, ladies and gentlemen, we get the United States the way it is. I know that many people have broken hearts tonight, today, whatever, this morning, this afternoon, and good night. <laughs> Many people have broken hearts because they've seen too much. The time of the hula hoops and the pool parties and the backyard barbecues is officially over. There is nothing like that anymore. Oh, you could have them, but it's just a bunch of people more like at a, at a reception for a funeral than it is of, you know, a, a, a kind of unself-conscious good time in the backyard. I, well, I say it because I love the barbecue. I love the, the whole, you know, getting together in the afternoon and the sun and the smell of the burgers and the whatever, and kids in the pool and, you know, that, that sort of thing that uh, America sort of grew up on. Well, not everyone had a pool, but there would be a barbecue at the apartment pool or whatever. Plenty, there are plenty of pools around. Don't get into that now. I mean, you know, not every, right? I mean, there's, there's 
you know, high school reunions down at the park where they have a barbecue, whatever. You know, the open barbecue. The, uh, the games. Get together at the park. People wondering and hoping and dr that they get that promotion or dreaming about a better world for them and their kids or moving into a little better house or trying to, f you know, whatever it is, you know, that, that hope and thing, right? that whole thing that, that's gone now. They wanted to wreck us of that because that gave us hope and that made us fight harder. They want to break our spirit. So there's no greater thing that uh, humanity can do for its own survival than get rid of this global revolutionary regime that's in power now. There's no greater thing you can do. But how you go about doing it will make all the difference. If you go with God, then you'll know what to do. Well, Z, I've been down there and I've got the Lord and everything. And then in battle, we took out all the men, women, and children in a village. I mean, we just had to do it. It's like, well, that happens. You know, that, that's, uh, you know, that has happened many times in the Bible as well. That very, that very thing that you describe. That makes you no less of a warrior. How are you now? You see. You know, I, I really need, you know, I mean, if I wasn't, I'm trying not to be as you know, feeble old man here, but I mean, I, I wish I could address the military about all this. Because, see, I don't, the reason I say that is because I don't think we can win unless we have, we have some of these principles restored within our, you know, unless we have faith restored. I don't see how we can be, you know, any decent other than just mercenaries out there just, just tearing it up for whatever, for a few private uh, interests. Okay. Here's in hopes that you will have a beautiful 2016, but I will tell you what I'm going to do. And I, I'm going to, folks, I'm, you know I struggle with this. You know, this cynicism of my seeing too much as a child and seeing too much as a, as an adult, that I try so hard to see the good in things, you know what I mean? And then I've, you've seen me kind of lose the battle and go on a rant, you know. I've just, that's unacceptable now. I, I, I realize the need to, to reclaim my pure heart because I, I am pure hearted. I, I'm not street smart. I, you know, street smart being, you know, cynical. Again, like you want to see street smarts, it would be a danza. Uh, the, 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 uh, the, the whore, maid, barmaid, cook, whatever. In uh, Man of La Mancha, played by Sophie, the wonderful Sophia Loren. Well, she had no makeup on. Now, yeah, what a naturally beautiful woman. I mean, it's unbelievable. Just unbelievable. And no Botox lips or whatever they put. Collagen lips, is that what it is, Trish? What do they do today with the lips? They made the trout pout. Seems like almost every other person's puffed their upper lip up, you know, even, even men. And, uh, but there was none of it. It was just a naturally beautiful woman. It's a sight to see. Oh, no, it's horrifying. Horrifying. And to see the men, you know, there was the men acting like jackals, all trying to get a piece off her. And they were fighting it back and Don Quixote having celebrating victory while she was hauled off by the evil men and, and thinking that he, he had won for her and then having to go out and reclaim her and finding her on the side of the road cursing him because him and his stupid pure-heartedness, his craziness. The world sucks, she was telling him. It sucks. It's awful. People are evil. Men only want one thing and one thing only and they don't care who they have to kill to get it and they'll, you know, steal and, and, and rape and pillage, and that's all, that's all anyone ever does, anybody. And then his quest. You see, the whole story is about a quest. It's a spiritual, it's a metaphor, it's a, if you will, an allegory for the quest in Christ. If you truly contend for the Lord, you're considered insane. I've been told, you're insane, Zaph. And all I've done is I contended, I quested for the Lord. And I wouldn't bow down to Satan. 
but I quested for the Lord. And I need to, to double down on that quest because I quest for the Lord. I have the light and I have the love. I have the agape. I have the virtue. I have the truth. I have the honor. But when I get mad at the, uh, you know, and it's gotten up and over me, folks. I tell you, it's gotten me. It's gotten me. It's gotten to me. I must keep my eye on the ball more, eye on Christ. And, and you know, there's some scriptures here. I hope to go over the God's, I have a God's promises for you. I want to line those up for this year and um, go over uh, the scriptures that have, that address certain things. I mean, I had a whole book on that. It was really very convenient because it had all the scriptures listed by, you know, you've probably seen books like this, by the promises of God in the Bible. So you can quickly get to about grief, about suffering and things. And, and you know, many of us don't need that because we already know where to go in the Bible for that comfort, for that, for that truth. But I think, uh, no, no, I'm not going to rate the app. But what I want to do is... Uh, I'm just gonna. This is a this is a, a talk about about pure heartedness. To the pure, all things are pure. Right? I always love that. How do we become pure? By when we take communion, and we become pure. When we when we can, when we pray to the Lord, when we cling to our Lord Jesus, we are pure because He is pure. We are pure. Okay. Where are we? Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Okay, we're in Titus. <clears throat> Titus one fifteen. Unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving... Nothing is pure. So let's just break this down for a second. To the defiled and unbelieving, how does one not be a pure heart? Because I believe in that Christ is the restoration of a pure heart where a heart's been broken or cynical. He restored to, right? to, to but disregard, disrespect for the flesh. You know, the, the, the just, to, 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 you know, running and gunning, you know, doing whatever thou wilt. Uh, that takes away your pure heart, obviously. But to the pure, all things are pure. See, to Don Quixote, everything was pure, everything. Dulcinea was really Adonza, the whore. Adonza, the cheap whore who do anything for money. Any kind of sex you want for money, she'll do it. But to Don Quixote, she was Dulcinea. <laughs> Don't tell me Cervantes did not have a good working knowledge of this Bible. Um, so we're talking about the word pure so but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving nothing is pure but even their mind and conscience is defiled you see I think what's happening here folks that's Titus 115 and um, but there's others like in James 127 it says pure religion and, and, and undefiled before God and the father is this to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction Absolutely. And to keep himself unspotted from the world. Well, this was Don Quixote's quest to, to defend the fatherless, you know, the, the, the orphans and widows and defenseless people, I might add, the meek, and to stand up for them, to, to be a knight errant. And to keep himself unspotted from the world. Well, unspotted from the world, there's only one way. You know, they say there's one way to rock and roll. This ain't it. There's only one way to keep yourself unspotted from the world. And it's not just blabbing your mouth off saying, I believe in Jesus. That's just words. The belief in Jesus is a verb. You're questing. And in your quest, you show belief in Jesus. Amen? Jesus is what you do, not what you say. Amen? Can I hear an amen? Not a reluctant amen, a big time amen. Belief in Jesus is not what you say. 
It's a verb. It's what you do. Amen? If you're pure of heart, you will do certain things. Amen? But you cannot be pure in heart unless the Lord purifies it because like me, you've been made pretty cynical from what you've seen and what you've been through, right? But we know that yelling and screaming like a danza in the Man of La Mancha, which they showed on the dish, they're having a musical. You know, um, the MGM musicals were famous for you know them filming musicals. MGM, that was their big heyday. I'm not sure this was very well cast or anything, but I'm just saying the ideas in it were very strong. But to Don Quixote, he would say, yes, in his quest he became pure. In the quest for Christ, we become pure. Because if we have all that we have on our minds is God and, and Jesus, and if, as long as we keep that on our forefront, you know, then we will become purified. And what that means is a pure heart, which means, you know, to the pure, you see the world a different way, obviously. And you let, you know, virtue and goodness be your guide and you're good, a force of good in the world. Now, sure, they'll laugh at you for not getting down, you know. They'll laugh at you for being you know, whatever. They'll call you crazy for, and, you know, for not understanding the nods and the winks. But when you're purified, ladies and gentlemen, you don't understand nods and winks. When you get, when you get harassed in gang stalking, it's because you, your hearts are not completely pure. There's an opening, a chink in your armor. There's something wrong there. There's some door that's open that's allowing that to get in, that cynicism, that impurity of heart, that, that fact that you've participated in your own defilement in some way. You know, these are things we must uh, try. It's okay if we... See, I guess the idea of Peter O'Toole in this was okay. He was bumbling around, really looking almost like a goofy clown. Rather than, I mean, already Don Quixote would be considered insane, even if he was a fairly skilled knight, but, but so delusional. But Don Quixote's delusion would be the follower of Jesus' normality. Normality. I did not say malady, I said malady. Normalcy. The questing for the truth to defend the meek, the widows and the orphans, and to be unspotted from the world is the purity of heart. Let's go over it again. Pure religion and undefiled before the Father is this. In other words, the pure quest, the person that is right in Christ, who's been restored, is this. To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and this can take on many forms. In other words, care for other people, to care for people that cannot care for themselves. To keep himself unspotted from the world. To keep himself unspotted from the world. Well, that's the knight errant. Of course he's unspotted from the world. He doesn't even see the world anymore. He only sees the pure in, in things. When he sees the enemy, he approaches the enemy with respect. If he slays the enemy, then he gives him a burial with respect. There's not this. Otherwise, we lose that which makes us human. And a good deal of humanity has been lost in America, I can tell you. We've been broken down through our moral. Our morals have been broken down. We have kids eight years old now, as cynical as a 50-year-old. I'm horrified, but I blame this administration. I blame myself. I blame the people we vote for. I blame our, our, our way of life here in America. I suppose we had it coming. 
I blame the fact that uh, we succumbed to this program to throw out God because they knew this would be the result. That's what they wanted, to control us. They knew they couldn't do it without breaking our morals down, without breaking us down as a people, without turning us against each other. Obama has done this better than any other president in the history of this country. He has turned us one against the other for the purpose of control and conquering, for the purpose of, I hate to say it, but delivering souls under the New World Order to, to ultimately create the ultimate darkness, the Luciferian regime, which no one would be allowed to even live, save they take a Luciferian initiation. This is in their own papers. This is not something that I am, I am speculating. This is what I've read for myself. This is a quote from one of them. A Luciferian utopia, a new world order, where the sky is the limit for the achievements of humanity. No, they want the singularity. They want the transmogrification of the DNA, or the transmutation, I'm sorry, of the DNA. They want the, the complete transhumanism and beyond. They want to depopulate the world and beyond. And if God would have allowed it, they would have already killed off billions. So they're doing it in every which way, thinking God doesn't see. Bill Gates, he doesn't believe there is a God, so he doesn't believe he's being watched and tracked every second of every day. Everything he does, says, and thinks is recorded. And when he hears the playback with all the trillions and trillions of souls watching his reaction, I think you can pretty much surmise what's going to happen to him. He will punish himself. So there is such a thing as going after the evil. I mean, I've seen this guy on YouTube, uh, Chris Green. Now, Chris Green has got kind of a new age, he sort of, you know, spiritual thing going, which a lot of them do. He's sort of a zeitgeist guy, you know, so... There's that. I've been I've supported his news because I felt he was on the truth, but my criticism of Chris Green is too cynical. Not much in the way of hope. Calling them out on what they're doing, but without offering us some hope, some way of dealing with that information. I think he's very talented. I've no I've watched him, I've got nothing but good things to say. I've, it's not really a criticism, it's just without the true spirit of what's without the truth about the spirit, about God. You, you, you tend to get cynical. You say all the stuff the administration's doing, all the stuff they're doing, how they're going to screw you, you know, every which way. And I've done that here. But I always try to lead us all into Christ because that's the solution. Okay? And now, I've, I haven't watched Chris in a long time, you know, but I, I, I but I, appreciated what he was trying to do, and I tried to help him, you know, and um, I, I recognize him as a kindred spirit as well, as a, another lamb out there, and I'm just hoping that um, that he'll see the light at some point. I know that I, I one time I had given him a small donation, you know, whatever, and I, I think he got wind of one of my podcasts and there's been like a disconnect ever since. <laughs> no, he does not appreciate people uh, talking about Jesus. No, I don't think so. Well, I had to kind of back away at that point, but uh, you know, I never give up hope. I've I've got my other guy who's even more insane. He's really totally, you know, Jehovah's. Uh, I haven't checked it on him, but he's Jehovah's a psychopath wanting to kill you all. You all have Stockholm syndrome. I mean, you know, and we're trapped in this dome of this earth, this earth, flat earth dome, and the, the evil God that made us and put us here won't let us out, and we're trapped, and we got to get out of here. <laughs> and I, um, I just don't want to see a guy like that become cynical. You know, he's not cynical right now, but because he's got an angle on this thing, you know, and that's preventing him from becoming cynical. You know what cynical is, ladies and gentlemen. It's when you give up. It's when you give up. It's when I give up. 
I can say all the evil this administration is doing. I can echo all Paul Craig Roberts's uh, writings, which have been, you know, the writings of John on the island of Patmos almost. He's on, he's on that level. He's great, but so cynical, Paul. I know he also loves the Lord and all that, but it's not coming through in his writings. It hasn't come through in a lot of my podcasts as well. I mean, it comes through eventually, but not until I go through this whole Sturm and Drang awful thing of, you know, getting all caught up and being upset with it all. You know, losing my quest, losing my contending for the faith, rather... Because, and I suppose that I'm innocent in this because, you know, they all tried to keep it from me in church and then, you know, when I, when I was young, I went to church. I mean, you know, it's just kind of a joke. But I mean, you know, we just goofed around in there. But I mean, you know, young, I, mean, I went to church, I went to private school, you know, had the best teachers, went to private beach clubs, had lived in a bubble, lived in a complete uh, sheltered environment, you might say. And a lot of what went into that sheltered environment was trying to shield us from the awful things of the world at the same time wooing us into accepting, you know, Satan's deal, breaking on through the other side, in other words. You know, trying to get us to break on through the other side at the same time not become cynical or, I don't know, there's this weird kind of double-minded thing they want you to do, which to the pure in heart would be impossible. The pure in heart would just die or be killed. And, you know, we tried not to see that. They tried to shelter that from us. The fact that people just get killed and there's no law enforcement, you know, to, the, the good guys don't come to the rescue, you know what I mean? That people just get killed and taken out like garbage. Then they create a story like a missing persons thing, and you know what I mean? It's just, it's terrible. It's terrible. It's, gosh, it's terrible. Oh, my God, it's terrible. The things I've seen are so bad, so terrible. I can't believe it. I... Half of them I can't say here because it's just so bad. I can't believe it. I, I've struggled to understand. Well, the worst thing I saw was people I grew up with, kids that I thought were friends, turn on me for no reason. And, I mean, there was a reason, but, I mean, how they were willing to just do away with me. Like I wasn't, like, nothing mattered. Like all the good times and all the bonding and all the things we've been through meant nothing. It's this Satan thing that meant everything. And the minute they got that going on, they wanted to turn and kill anyone who didn't agree. My God, my God, that was the worst of all of it. I think betrayal is the worst trauma we can experience. I think that's why the Satanist reveres it so highly. Betrayal you know, in other words, you've got someone very trusted. You know, I watched a video the other day. Someone said, watch, the Secret Service agent turns around and blows Kennedy's head off. And, uh, and they slow it down, and it looks like the guy does turn, but I can't quite see if there's a guy shooting or not. But if he did shoot Kennedy, it would be the ultimate betrayal. A guy that's in your own car in the front seat turns around and shoots you right in front of all these people. I thought he, if that were true, he'd be worried that people would see him. But, I mean, whatever. Kennedy was betrayed by his own, obviously. They wouldn't have driven into that killing, killing, killing floor, that killing zone. They had to all be in on it, everyone. They were in on it when Jack Ruby got shot. Everyone, part, like, parting the red, all these people in the room, they're bringing Jack Ruby out, or they're bringing uh, Oswald out, and Ruby just, they, they, they pause, so that Ruby can step up, shoot him, and then they and then they deal with it. Like the 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 police didn't even bother really with Ruby. I mean, they got him, you know, right away. But I mean, it was all scripted. You could see that. As a kid, you know, I was disturbed. But what disturbed me was the way they let him in to do it. When I didn't know how to say it to myself when I was so young, you know. Um, you know, what, eight or nine years old or something, and 63, let's see, it'd be three years, and six would be nine, so I'd be like eight or nine. So to, to see that on television, 
you know, I realized what traumatized me as a kid wasn't the fact that Oswald got shot and killed right in front of me. I saw it on live TV. I did, it was not a rerun. I saw it live. It was, you know, because I was watching TV after the Kennedy thing. It was the idea that they let him do it. He didn't just surreptitiously sneak in. It was all seemed staged to me at that age. And it took me a long time to, to of, you know, it gave me PTSD, I think. It took me a long time to, to really bring that back to mind and say, oh, yeah, they, they all had to participate in that. And that's, that's what the heart of my mural on my, my mural, my, my collage, took up a whole wall of my room. And it had uh, Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy and, and Martin Luther King. And I had words I cut from magazines, you know, meanings and headlines. And I'd, you know, have them say things that I, I was feeling. And um, I said the very same thing, you know, that, you know, the who killed Kennedy and what killed him, you know, how we did. We all did. In other words, it all was staged. I, I, I indicated that. And I think that's what got my mother to rip that thing down. It was a whole wall of art in a, whole, in a fairly large size room. You know, it took a long, you know, years to put it all up, but it was, you know, obviously saving, well, maybe it was too, too left wing leaning. It could have been left wing, I don't know. But I realized at that age there was something wrong I realized that the, 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 how it was set up ahead of time, you see. There was nothing organic about anything. I knew that at that age. And apparently my parents did too, but they wanted to believe that, you know, if we kept our mouths shut and didn't think about stuff like that, we could live in this nice, insulated world, untouched by all the evils of the world. You know, if we would just play ball, but, but still, in order to have that little bubble, we have to give something up to them, to the world. And they would let us be in our bubble. I'd underscore the term, let us, allow us to. In other words, rights come from someone else, not us, and not God. So I'm like, hell no, I'm not giving anything up to these. These are the jerks that made all this, this whole mural I did, this whole collage wall. They're the ones that, that, that made it possible. I mean, they're the ones that set it all up. They're the ones who ruined this world. I will fight the evil. I'm not going to join it. But all my friends did. My real friend, my other friends are dead. So they didn't make it. They were just pure hearts. You see, they, they were like my brother. They, 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 they refused to see the world as it was. Now, I both see the world as it is. And I see the world as it should be. And I struggle between those two things in these podcasts, as you know. Don Quixote sees the world as it is, as Cervantes. And then he sees the world as it should be, as Don Quixote. And the world, in this case, Don Quixote's extended family and extended family, his niece and her bride-to-be and others, sought to bring Don Quixote back to reality. A householder, a wealthy gentleman of that time, of that old, older time, say the 1800s, I guess. Long after the knights had disappeared. to bring him back to reality because after all there were matters that needed to be settled to break his spirit to be cruel to psychologically destroy him so they could have the money a 
upon his death. What's so wrong, he would say, about seeing the world as it should be rather than what it is? And questing to make it right, to putting down the evil and to doing the right thing, despite everyone else doing the wrong thing. What's wrong with that? Well, people that do that get labeled crazy. Okay, okay, I understand. You're not going to play ball with the world. You're not going to. You're not going to give it up to Satan. You're not going to join the club. Okay, got it. You're going to because you don't want to be evil. You don't want to participate in evil. You don't want to kill people. You don't want to 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 join in the evil so that you can have a little slice of heaven off to the side where you can where you can convince yourself every day that it's not that bad, it's not that bad, it's not, I didn't do anything wrong, I didn't do anything wrong, you know, until they call you again on the phone or whatever in your psychic head. Versus being a pure heart through questing, a quest the Knight's Quest, which is uh, an analog and an allegory to the quest for Christ. I.e., the world thinks you're crazy. Why would you give all this up? All the fun. All the pleasures. Why deny yourself? And the answer, ladies and gentlemen, is quite simple. Look at the world as it is. That's why. It needs to change. That's why. All good people know. And all good people need to understand the change begins with us. Inside of every one of you and me. The decision to quest for good Expose evil, yes, but don't just bark at it because the same evil exists within us as well. To put that evil down within us, to conquer that in our quest for Christ, to do the verb, the works of Christ as a reflection of what is in us, naturally and without strain, though the world thinks we're insane. I know people that laugh at me and I've done them financial favors. I have blessed them in a way no one else has ever blessed them. I've given them so much and they still laugh at me. Like I must be crazy to have been so kind to them, not knowing what assholes they've been to me. Wow. But the Lord had me being nice to them because of what assholes they were to me. Because that changed things. And I see they've been changed. So it was a good thing. I don't regret it. Yes, I was a fool in terrestrial terms, but no fool. The Lord was doing a, a yeoman, of a, a, not a yeoman's work, that's what I do, but a, a big work. Giving to them who crap on you. Giving them the shirt off your back while they snicker and laugh at what a fool you are for having done so. Knowing because of how evil they've been to you and what they've said behind your back and all that. Being such a fool of nobody in their right mind would give the shirt off their back to someone if they really knew what was going on behind the scenes regarding yourself. Well, I did know. I w would act as if I didn't. I had at least some respect for them. I shielded them from, from that because they're just, they're just foolish to think they are getting away with anything. And then I gave them something with no, no need for any response and no need for anything return. Because the Lord had me do that. I mean, this has happened occasionally throughout my life. And I'd always wonder, Lord, why are you having me do something for them when they've been so mean to me? 
And then the Lord would say back to me, precisely. <laughs> exactly. You got it. Wow. But then if I go off and try to do something for somebody that the Lord doesn't sanction, then it doesn't, he doesn't, he blocks it. See what I mean? So it, it just, if being mean to you and awful is one thing, but unless the Lord leads it, unless he's doing a work, it, it doesn't mean anything. It just makes you look like a fool. Yes, I know it's tough. Questing for the Lord. Questing, questing, questing for the Lord is, is the most, that is, you know, and forgive what I said earlier about, you know, you know overthrowing the evil regime, you know, putting a new regime in, whatever. Uh, the greatest thing a man can do, obviously, is to conquer that evil within himself and go on that quest for good. To, to become purified, to, to, you know, that's the greatest thing that, that a man could do for all humanity, of course. Of course I already knew that. But for humanity's survival, the, the, the change of the regime that's in power now, uh, worldwide, no, 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 I'm not just saying United States, worldwide, you know, um, is the, now, another lesson in history, the people that are in power now, okay, a certain kind of people, this is a DNA thing, okay? This, this is the same kind of people. They're not you. They lead the world into war and darkness. You've seen World War I. You've seen World War II. These are the same people. And what we're trying to do is have the Lord intervene on behalf of humanity to not see... We don't want to see children dying not knowing why they lived or children uh, with Hollywood costumes and guns with, with exotic camera angles like uh, an A-list movie blowing the heads off people when they're just, these are prepubescent boys killing adult males who have been captured by ISIS as a way of horrifying the world that the children are doing the killing. Let us not, let us not tolerate that. I know Obama created that. I know that's his baby. I know that, that he's got his Hollywood people on it. I mean, it's as well as, of course, you know, the CIA, the NSA, blah, 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 the blah, blah, blah. But he was groomed. This is a CIA baby. You understand that? And I don't mean all the CIA. I mean, you know, from that, you know, CIA almost is a euphemism of that dark area of CIA, of, you know, that they, 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 they put in Hollywood movies with the Bourne, the Bourne series. Now, people aren't stupid. There's this kind of thing going on all over the place. Well, they have these, you know, they groom up people to be leaders that will be beholden to them. And this is certainly being beholden to them. But I would say to these CIA people, where do you think you're taking this world? You're taking this world and your children and everyone else to hell. And they're no good. They'll no utopia, no nothing. Nothing for anyone. Death, destruction, and hell for everyone. Is that your purpose? And of course they don't believe that's the purpose. They believe they're making it a better world. Well, on a last note here, I believe that we should contend. Quest for Christ. Now, I don't want to be like the churches myself where it's just Pollyanna, you know, rose-colored glasses and that's it. And they don't see the, you know, they shield the people from the world. They say you, you can't talk about the government or the evils they do or all this stuff. God's got it, and it couldn't be that. They tell me they couldn't be that because all governments are from God, so it's, they can't, the things you're saying they do, the pedophilia, the human trafficking, that's wrong. That's, that's blasphemy. Those are lies. They don't do those things. All governments come from God, they say. Now, you believe it too. Well, they know all governments. They, they know the truth, but they're trying to put us I, that's, to me, not questing. That's not the kind of pure-heartedness I'm talking about, okay? That's mind control and coming from the evil place. I'm talking about the purification of the heart, the questing for Jesus Christ, and, and with eyes open in this world, but with heart purified by him for real, not just acting a certain way because you think that's good, 
acting like you don't see the evil, you know, seeing the, the good out of it because you're just doing that. That's an act of you, a human act. I don't, I'm not talking about a human quest. I'm not, it's a human quest, yes, but it's a quest that God is making for himself through us to show us something. I'm talking about our hearts being purified by him and not by us. I'm seeing that we see the world the way he wants us to see it and not the way it, that we see it. That he shows us the real world the way it really is, is the way we don't, not just seeing the evil, not just seeing the good, but the way it really is, or the, the ultimate, through his eyes, through his word, through his glory, rather than through our own interpretation. I know many people that just put on, they glue on the good fruit, they, they glue it on, they, they, they put on the, uh, the good attitude, they put on the right, the, the, the right reaction to dialogue. I'll say, wow, shoot, the government, this looks terrible. And they'll say, oh no, but brother, it's like there's so many good things happening. And, but you see, it's not coming from that place of Christ. It's coming from that, 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 that need they have to not, you know, they feel if they don't go there, that they, 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 they're doing a good work for Christ. No, 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 I say no a thousand times. No, not that. That's fake. Don't do that. I would rather have you be cynical then, like a donza. And all men are maggots. Go ahead. But don't do that other thing. Please, for God's sake, don't do that. For your sakes, don't do that. People that do that are on a path of complete internal destruction. They lie to themselves, you see. If you don't have a purified heart, if you can't quest, if you're just damned angry, I guess be that, but I pray the Lord touches you and brings you up and brings you to the quest and sets you along, uh, sets you uh, down the path of the quest and that you never look back. And let us, let us do that quest. That pure, I cannot purify my own heart, can you? Simply by looking away from the evil? No, no, no. Well, if I didn't look at social media, I'd be a lot less cynical. Well, perhaps indeed you would, but if your heart was pure, you could look at social media all day long. It wouldn't affect you one bit. Not one bit. Nothing would affect you. Nothing. Nothing. You know, I lamented, you know, Lemmy and some rock and roll stuff, you know, the, the uh, Motorhead thing, the, you know, I was realizing, wow, no shredding guitar. I heard a song of theirs on this surf movie yesterday about John Florence. It was an hour long. It was great. It was amazing. Beautiful. Beautiful. You know, it wouldn't appeal to most people, but if you've ever surfed, you'd, you'd, you'd love it. Um... Just amazing photography, just just gorgeous. I shot a lot with real film, you know, I mean, real stuff. These are guys, these surfers in Hawaii and elsewhere, you know, they, these young people, they, they have all the old cameras, all the, they, they shoot with film, you know, underwater, big waves, you know, curling right at you. They played this Motorhead song and it was like, the guitar was like, you know, uh, shoot, I could play faster than that. You know, and uh, well, but I realized that the reason that I couldn't, that I fell away from Motorhead as a fan, really, and, and a lot of the rock and roll, was because it's too carnal for me. I was a fan of the psychedelic because it, at least it was about expanding the mind, you know. But it's too, it's too, it was too... Uh, Carnal is about, you know, having sex with people. I, I was like, ah, you know, even the song with Lemmy. You know, see, yeah, I love the iconic voice and love his bass playing and love the whole kind of rebellious vibe. You know, he died at 70. But it was, again, about, you know, calling him up to go have sex, fast and loose it was called. And they were trying to talk about surfing as fast and loose in the tube, you know, and doing a uh, parallel between Lemmy singing fast and loose, meaning about sex. And it did ultimately didn't work, and I realized, ah, Lemmy's. You know what I mean? The problem with with Motorhead and 
metal. My daughter's a big metal head, so I get a lot of the new metal, the metal you've never heard of <laughs> that she listens to. And I listen to lyrics. We go over the lyrics together when we get together. And I've got, I've got to go to Italy, and, and we've got to hang out together, and I've got, to, I've got to go through the lyrics with her. And I point out being a lyricist myself, you know, and she's a fan of my music, so it's, it's pretty cool to have a daughter that's a fan of your music. She goes, you're so Zeph. <laughs> it's Zeph. I love that last song. It's all Zeph. You know, she's like that. I'm just like, so cool. I was so blessed with my daughter. It's unbelievable. Now, how about that? She's like my Dulcinea, you know, I mean, not romantically or whatever, but she's like, I've, I have this idea of her of, as, I do have a romantic idea of her having, you know, uh, her life of being a vegan and having a vegan truck and she's joining a band now and, you know, a girl drummer. Is that cool? She's working hard. She's taking lessons and she reads music. She, she sight reads uh, drums and um, you know it's pretty awesome. I, I'm just like I gotta I gotta I, I don't want to pressure you know. It's like you know would I love her to be a drummer after her father's um, you know my being a drummer. What what do you think? I just hate the long distance between us, but we can do something about that. I have the I have every ability to do something. I'm going to I'm gonna take get my portable rig going and I'm gonna you know bring it with me on the plane and. Off we're going to go. But uh, anyway, we go through this. And she was a big Motorhead fan. She could tell me. Right last thing she saw, she saw a corn in concert. And she was like, fell in love with them totally. And I'm like, so we go through the lyrics, you know. And corn has got some, some, you know, aware lyrics like Megadeth does. But in listening to old Motorhead, I was, I was thinking to myself, what, what was I thinking I need to go somewhere. I need to quest. You know, I've all, I need to be more like Don Quixote and not just a lamb who's affected by it all. I mean, that puts me as ultimate fool between two things. I, I got to be totally, I hate to put it this way, but balls out for the Lord, you know? To the wall. To the wall, ladies and gentlemen. Fervent more so than I ever was before. I've got to be that because the alternative is they're going to chop my mind into a million bits. I'd rather die questing for the Lord than live as a coward, huh? Than live between two worlds, kind of cowering and hovering, you know, hiding in the corner. Agreed? 2016, we're going to bust out of that. How do you bust out? Let's double down on the Lord. Let me get those promises next time. I got this great book. It was published back in, I don't know, the 90s or something. But it's great in terms of, uh, you know, I mean, I've seen lots of promise books. That, promise books just basically take the scriptures and divide them and categorize them into, okay, grief, sickness. You know what I mean? Protection. And it's very, very helpful, especially when they have it do the KJV Bible. You know what I mean? They, they, don't, they don't editorialize. They just, they just categorize makes it really easy for someone like me with radio to be able to say, okay, you know, here's what we're feeling. My main thing is I got to repent. Okay, some New Year's resolutions. Numero uno, I don't want their mind control to get to me. Okay? I got to keep that away from me at all costs. They want me to be bummed out. They want me to be angry at the government. You know, angry like, like, like you know, calling for revolution because they want to come put my ass down. I mean, obviously, if it's a spiritual battle, that would be... One way to do it. I'm not violent. I'm not violent in that way. I mean, you know, there are people that are warriors and revolutionaries that would do fighting and stuff, and there's people that are also spiritual revolutionaries. That's me. I'm more of a spiritual warrior, and that's where I fit. But we all fit in different things. There are people that probably are plotting on doing something or other, but I, I just can't. I just have to take the way it as I see it. I need to be a spiritual warrior and quest in the spirit and through prayer and through my quest, verb, action to make the world a better place. In other words, to, to, first of all, to change myself. You know, through, I guess, it's just yielding myself to God and having him change me 
and that way of uh, really seeing the world for what it is rather than getting mad with every little thing. You know what I'm saying? If I'm questing after the Lord, the world's taken care of. If I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, the world's taken care of. I'm doing all I could do for the world, right? But in terms of studying every day how evil these people are, that's letting them set the agenda and making me feel weak and them all powerful. No. No, I say. No to that. No to that. Not making the world off because we see their evil deeds every day. How can we possibly fight them? That's what they want us to think. So no to that. Keep that little bit of that popcorn. Yeah, I had popcorn last night. Big New Year's Eve night for me. Popcorn and Don Quixote and an orange. Yep. Yep. Anthony uh, Gucciardi had a, a good... Uh... Just by saying that name, it's, he's, that's evil. That's, you know, right. People get so mad at me for talking about people in Infowars. They just get so mad. Oh, really? Yeah. Don't they understand that the Infowars is uh, the good guys? No, that's, that's interesting. I don't want to look into that, of them being the bad guys, but it's starting to look like they are the bad guys. I mean, you know, what side are they on? That's a good question. The anti-Jew people, what side are they on? To me, it seems like they're on the side of the New World Order. You know? I'm sick of listening to them. I, I'm sick of listening to everybody. I've got a quest after this thing. Look, I, I've seen how evil evil is. When I was a child, my God, I mean, I saw things that no child should ever have to see. I, I don't want to look at that. I don't want to have that set my agenda. And, and then seeing the adults today acting like like, you know, the adults in my life when I was a child, and they're no different today than they were then. And re add the rest of the world, the poverty and the wars and the senseless killing and all that. My God, my God. And all the hurting and starvation that we've caused and deprivation of water and goods and services. You know, all this stuff that, you know, you know, we don't take care of each other. We just, in this country now, we just want to kill each other. I think this is terrible. I, I can't look at the, I can't let them win, folks. I won't let them win. As long as, how do they win? By making my heart cynical and taking it away from the pure pureness by making it a cynical heart, a broken heart. They win. By causing me to be cynical and therefore cruel to my fellow man, just like they are, justifying it because it sucks anyway. Who cares? So not, right? They win. Evil wins. The people in charge of the world right now, they're the carnal people. They're the, they're, they're the non-spiritual, brutish, you know, reptilian, whatever you want to call them, just slow-thinking, shallow, vapid, um, banal kind of, you know, they just want what they want and bludgeon anyone who doesn't give it, you know, that kind of power mad psychopath, whatever you want to call it. I'm not going to give in to that. I saw enough of that in my youth when all of my friends became psychopaths and then they turn on you. You know, they, they, they went with the world system, they got their initiation and they became horrible monsters. Now they're all crying and looking for God, you know, it's like, God. Well, I guess repent over all the pain you caused other people that weren't like you, who for whatever reason couldn't see what you could see in your, in your corrupted hearts. I don't want to go that way. When I was a child, I wanted to quest after the truth. I liked the psychedelic music because it was about questing, it was about expanding into the universe. You know what I mean? It was, even though they were trying to use it for, for, for devil worship, basically. You know, I was seeing something else, seeing something breaking out of this box. I quest for the Lord, and certainly then I understand the benefit of virtue, honor, sincerity, pureness of heart, of course, respect for other people, even enemies, all of this is, is, are qualities of not just Don Quixote, but these are the qualities that get you labeled as crazy. <laughs> but for real, not gluing it on. I know so many people that are so fake, they just 
glue on the rose-colored glasses and they just tell you the world is something other than what it is or they, they distract themselves endlessly with things that take them away from the realization of just what it is. When my friend Todd saw what it was, he was so freaked out he couldn't, he couldn't talk anymore. Next thing I know, he winds up dead, you know, because he wasn't, he wasn't going to become one of them because he, he was a pure heart is why. He was like my brother. He was like me. He was like many of you. And they try all our lives to trick us or to tempt us or to, to, to hurt us or to use the carrot and the stick to try to get us into line. It's like line with what? With degradation, with cynicism, with, with, with senseless killing, with, with uh, 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 you know, um, sex is going to the bathroom. With, with that, you mean? With, 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 with be- ugliness as beauty? With everything opposite the way it should be? You mean realist into that, like that's a virtuous thing to be? Of course not. I want a quest for the good. An errant knight, a knight of honor, would eschew all that. Would, of course, wouldn't even be a question as to whether or not to sign up. They wouldn't do it in the first place because it would be recognized as signing on with evil to take a shortcut to have a decent time of it, to help the Nazis kill your fellow Jews so that you can have a couple of steak dinners before they blow your head off. No, no, and no. Anyway, God bless the pure hearts, for they will see God. God bless the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Jesus was the first Don Quixote. He was considered crazy, but he backed it up with miracles. He was more real than anybody else was in terms of doing what he said he was going to do. Everyone else was hot air. Backing up what he said, everyone else was hot air. Don Quixote is a modern-day picture of Jesus, or of certainly one of the apostles, questing for the Lord. You know, the mistakes that people in the Old Testament made, like David and Solomon and various other people, you know, I mean, everyone made Abraham, Moses, whatever, they all made mistakes. The apostles, when they had the Holy Spirit after the Pentecost, they didn't make those mistakes. They were questing on the pure quest. The Holy Spirit had purified them. They weren't like the men of the Old Testament. I think you know that. I think you understand how much different it is, how this Jesus changes everything. I mean, it's not the Old Testament at all. It's the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament, but it's, it's the fulfillment of everything, of all things. But the world can't see it because Christ is the cornerstone of the world that was rejected by the stone builders. You could take it on one level, the Masons, who built this Luciferian awful world, rejected the cornerstone. So their building that they made can never stand completely without a cornerstone. So they will fail at their new world order, which is at the very heart of it, Masonic, which include, it includes the Jews, it includes the Catholics, Includes the atheist and the New Agers and the nothing and all points in between. It includes, it's basically a group of you know what. On the surface, they're Masons. They believe they're, they're knights. That they're there to take care of the fatherless and the widows and the children. And what's happened is the inner corruption has made them corrupt where they will do that as a surface PR campaign while the evil rages on, and they do nothing about that but foster it. That's the truth about that, and that's 
who all the banking societies belong to, all the guilds, everyone at the end of the day belongs to that. You can call it the Knights Templar, you can call it the, the Club of Rome, you can call it whatever you like, but it's just one club. And that's why Brother Thomas was thinking that, you know, Putin probably as a Mason is involved in it, you know. Um, I, well, I know, Trish, you don't think so. You made your voice well known. I hope not. I hope maybe he's repentant of that. But my grandfather knew. He told me about it. He was, a, he was maybe not supposed to tell me about it, but he was a 33-degree Mason and beyond, uh, one of the top people in the world. And uh, he told me all about everything. And I wish he didn't. <laughs> and I'm not going to repeat what he said. Because, I mean, you already know what you know, all the evil is anyway. You don't need me to hear from me. But, I mean, yeah, what everyone else has said and how, you know, for, from a firsthand kind of view, yeah, you're, you're right. It, it, it's actually worse than that, but it's along those lines. And that's all I'm going to say about it. It's, I've been working my whole life to try to forget that. My whole life I've tried to pretend that doesn't exist. I just don't want to see people in high places as that evil. I just, I, I refuse. I won't. I will not. This is the year 2016 of the pure heart. And I'm, I have begun my quest. And I am feeble and I'm clumsy. I'm falling off my horse. I'm tilting at windmills, and, I'm, and the windmill is beating me half the time, but I'm going to keep on for the, you know. That's right, I want to see the, the prostitutes as Dulcinea. That's right, I want to see the people that, they may have toiled in the evil, but then I want to see them repent and become purified knights. Yes. And you know what that means, don't you, ladies and gentlemen? You, that means you're no longer part of that world system. You're no longer in that hive mind. You're, you're no longer part of the collective. You've been delivered out by Jesus Christ. And that's the only way you're getting... By the way, can a man will himself out of the contract with Satan? The answer is no. A man cannot will himself out of the contract with Satan once he's given into it. No. He has to be delivered by a supernatural force. The only one I know of is Jesus Christ. Period. May I put it like, no, seriously. I'm, I'm being, I had a guy, a lovely guy that, you know, I, hey, all of you that don't believe like I do, you're lovely people, I understand, or at least potentially lovely people. But I'm telling you, just save yourself 20, 30 years here. You cannot deliver yourselves from evil to good. What about if you never joined up? Well, still, you can't be delivered into Christ unless Christ delivers you. Whether you signed up for the Satan club or not, it doesn't matter. We're still all evil and fall short of the glory of God. Look at your hearts. You know you're capable. You, why didn't you sign up? You should have. I, I don't mean that. I mean, you, you know what I'm trying to say. You know, you're no, they're, you're no better than them. Don't think it's a virtue inherent to you being human that made you more of a pure heart, because that's what it means. You're more of a pure heart, so you didn't see it. Okay, fine. But that still doesn't really make you better ultimately, because you still have traits of evil within you. Would you not agree? And that the Lord needs to purify that, we have to work really hard to keep that, to, to keep that quest going. And what's the quest for? Well, the errant knight was to be of service to humanity. To fight the evil in these windmills. Even if they beat him, he fell off his horse. Yeah, but what about the New World Order and the rest of it? He's fighting the evil, the New World Order, through the windmill. Don't you understand? It's holographic in a way. It works a certain way. You know, it's, if you just take care of your quest, you will fight the evil. It will diminish. 
You, it, it may seem impossible to the mortal man, but to you nothing is impossible, because with God nothing is impossible. So let us take that promise, that word, nothing is impossible, and let's go to it. I got a big phone book Bible, and I'm going to dive into it again. The analog Bible, not just reading off the, you know, the iPad app. Anyway, this Cervantes, you know, the way they portrayed him in the film anyway, he knew all about how evil the world was. There's nothing that's happened here that he hadn't seen back then. With the Inquisition, you know, I mean, thinking about things like the Inquisition, Think about things like, I may have misspoke about when I said the 1800s. I, I actually, you know, as far as Don Quixote, so many people have done so many different things. I'd have to go back and read. I can't tell you the time right now that it's locked in, but it's time after the nights. And it's, but it's also, it was the Inquisition around then? Yeah, because see, later on they were chasing people around in New Mexico. I think they were chasing the Jews around New Mexico. That's right, the Jews were here. The Jews were actually here in the 1400s, so we have to go, you know, maybe we go back to the 1400s with Cervantes. I'm not, I don't want to give the date right now, but yes, the Inquisition was chasing the Jews all the way up to, uh, they chased them from the southern border to Mexico, all the way up into Colorado, where the Jews, where Hebrews were um, here. You know, before uh, before the United States was, uh, you know, formulated. So it's, there's quite a history here in the United States that people don't know. I know that. I read that at the airport. At the airport, they have a mural that showed the history of New Mexico. And it was just on the, it was just written there. I'm like, wow, do people know this? The Inquisition and the Jews, and they're chasing each other around, <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's pretty interesting, isn't it? That was way before we had a... Uh, Constitution, or this goes, like I say, back to the 14, mid-1400s. Yeah, pretty wild, right? Um, but in the Inquisition back then, you know, the, the, the threat of the Inquisition, should you be blasphemous? In other words, should you, I think with the opening of the Man of La Mancha, uh, Peter O'Toole character of Don, not yet Don Quixote, but uh, Cervantes, he was saying that, uh, you know, he was saying that the, the words of scripture should be in the hands of people, you know, like, like almost a Martin Luther type of thing, and, and as opposed to just being centralized in the Catholic Church. So he was, he was uh, rebelling in that way, saying that, you know, that the, the scripture should be with all men, you know, the, 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 the work of the Bible and the, and, the, and the scriptures and the knowledge and you know, the, the, the power should be with all people, not just in the church. So they arrested him for that. There are people today that believe if you do not belong to the Catholic Church, you are going to hell. Which is 100% propaganda. There is not a word of, tr there's not a, a scintilla of truth to it. And it, it, they, they base it on the fact that, that Jesus said, uh, you know, you're Peter the Rock, and upon you I will be. I will. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not tear it down. And they feel they are the church of Peter, and that um, basically the gates of hell will not tear it down. If any man does not belong to that church, he is going to hell because Jesus said in His Word that that basically um, the church is the way. You know, and they he didn't say that. The Catholics took it to mean that the Catholic Church was the church he's talking about. His church is not of this world. He's always said that, Jesus. He's, so, I mean, that's, you, you have to ignore the, the, the basic uh, scripture of my kingdom is not of this world. The church of Jesus Christ is the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And uh, the gates of hell will not tear it down because it's not of this world. Catholics, listen, it is not terrestrial. What he's talking about is the forever church, which is the kingdom of God, which is not controlled by the Catholics. Thank you. 
Only a gullible, ignorant people would believe such a thing. He never said that anyway. So you'd have to add to that list dishonest. Dishonest or unthinking, uncaring of the truth. So he was against the Inquisition, Don Quixote, Cervantes, but Don Quixote would have been also had we had more episodes. I'd love to see weekly episodes of Don Quixote and various things, but he would be against the idea that the Catholics would say that you've got to come to us for absolution. He would, of course, you know, go up against that. He would go up against a totalitarian state if that's what the government like the United States is trying to instill. But he would do it in such a way as to fight the evil out there, the evil, the evil demons that are taking the form of windmills. I can see them. Yes, we must go. Sancho, we must go get them. We must not let them get away with controlling the people here upon the earth. We have a very portentous sun raising up, ladies and gentlemen. It's a, it looks like a big eye, an orange eye, ensconced in clouds. I don't know what it means, but it means to me right now somber, thoughtful, repentant, hopeful, knowing that God sees all we do anyway, everything we think anyway, everything we do anyway, everywhere we go, whatever, not just the eyes of the hive mind of Saturn, everywhere, what, you know, remember the song I did Saturn, everywhere I look, everywhere I go, cha-cha-cha, remember that? Sometimes I get sarcastic, but a lot of people say they don't understand my humor, so... <laughs> Well, it's, if you do understand it, you'd have a ball. You really would. But, you know, I can't, I can't, you know, it's like telling somebody why the joke is funny. You know, it's, you, you know you didn't, it didn't come over. It didn't work. So that's all. Doesn't matter. I don't care if it works or not. See, that's the thing. I got a song I'm doing right now about San Bernardino. It's in really bad days, but it's just flowing out of my spirit. So San Bernardino, you know, a, a, a colloquialism or a, Nickname for San Bernardino, San Bernardino, San Berdu, San Berdu, yeah. And Frank Zappa, when he did a song about San Bernardino, he called it San Berdino. He took the Bernard out, so it's San Berdino. And then the, the locals just call it San Berdu, right? To shorten it, Sam Berdu. Or sometimes I'll say Berdu, going up to Berdu. Right? Make it even shorter. Uh, San Bernardino in, in uh, Frank Zappa's tune spend the rest of their lives in San Bernardino. Remember that? Ah, it's one of my all time favorite songs. So funny. <laughs> I love humor, you know, I love that kind of humor, so I'm going to do more of that stuff in 2016. I'm going to do a lot more tracks. We got one going here, we got one going there, I got one going there, I got one going there. So expect a harvest of... But what, what you get strictly from me is going to be very, very sarcastic, you'll say. Okay, but uh, wrapping up then, you know, wrapping up, I didn't say all the resolutions, I just said two. Not let the mind control get to me, and not lose my pure heart, but quest for the Lord and, and keep my heart purified by questing, you know, fervently questing. And so I'm not going to, you know, the ragging I've done on Obama lavishing himself, forget about that. The evil ruler, forget about that. Forget about that. I've got, I can't go there. See, they win if I get mad about that. They win. What, what should I care if he spends 70 million or 10 billion million? Who cares? We have to quest to make this a better world by questing for the Lord. Pure religion is this, widows and orphans and remaining unspotted from the world. Well, 
As far as I'm concerned, you know what spots me? You want to know where I'm corrupt? Is letting this stuff get to me. That corrupts me. Because you know what it does? Turns me cynical. Then I become no better than them. It's like, yeah, maybe it's more humane to kill everybody off. You know what I mean? What kind of a statement is that? That's a psychopath. That's a psychopath. I don't want to go to that. Yes, there's a lot of people that feel that way, but I don't want to join them. I think they, they, you know, and I think, I think, well, the NSA must be spying. I think they're just laughing at me is what they're doing. I don't think they take me seriously at all. You know? They're not going to bother me. I'm, they probably think I'm good for, the, for their quest if they want to have an evil. I think part of the reason they think that is because, you know, I have reacted to, I mean, back when I was talking about the evil that they do, you know, nobody was talking about it. Now it just seems to be everywhere. So I don't want to, that's, but I, I can't have a life like that. I must quest for the truth, for the good, for the spiritual good, for the, uh, for the, for the decent things in man, you know, for the, for the meek that they would have a voice, you know, for the, those kind of things. I mean, what happened to that pure-hearted quest? How about the fact that when I run after Christ, he purifies me as a result of the verb run after what about this cynicism on the Zeph report and, and the use of foul language? Not, I mean, I know that sounds almost funny, but, you know, Don Quixote would never use a foul language like that. Never, not, not and ever, never. Anyway, like I said, he was a laughingstock, of course. Of course. He was mocked as a laughingstock because he, you know, he wasn't going to throw his hat into the ring. I'll just put it that way. He wasn't going to have the great life everybody else was having. Not. They're all suffering and hurting each other and raping each other and killing each other. They're, I can't believe, Don, that you don't want to get in on some of this. What are you, a fool? Crazy? Ha, ha, ha. He's a madman. Ha. Look, he's, he's, he's calling this whore Dulcinea. Ha, 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 ha. He's pledging his knighthood to her, to protect her, to, to fight the evil on her behalf. <laughs> Doesn't it seem, ladies and gentlemen, that the quest of Don Quixote, does it seem now that that's the only quest that's worthwhile? It could take the form of hiking up a mountain even, or Disciplining every thought, word, and deed to be in alignment with what an errant knight should be. Making half an effort rather than just saying it all sucks. As far as whether you're initiated and indoctrinated in the world system, I have one thing to say. No one can live there. You either come out of there or perish. It's just that simple. It's like the lost boys in Pinocchio, right? They're lost. So the reason there's so much evil in the world is because too many people have run that way of corrupted hearts and cynicism. Oh, well, it's all evil. It's, there's no way to get ahead unless you... So I'm going to take it easy, take her easy and uh, go along to get along. Hardy, har, har, you know? Nobody can live there. Nobody. And uh, fortunately, and I think the mistake we've all made on the internet, and this is a huge mistake, and this is, I'm not going to, I, I, I want to add this as a third resolution. The big mistake we've made on the internet is that we've, the big mistake we've made on the internet is trying to fight evil with, with angry words. I mentioned Christopher Green and his AMTV network that does a, you know, he's like a, kind of like another Alex Jones in a way, but smaller, you know, but he, he really kind of created this little network and he does a good job, but the thing is, is that 
he he I can tell it's weighing on him, you know, over the time, and and, he, and of course it weighs on all of us. I'm using his as an example of something I've done too. You know, he's not the only one, but in other words, by barking at them about the evil that they do and about the people they hurt, it doesn't do any good unless our hearts are pure. We must purify ourselves before we approach such a subject. You see what I mean? Or find a way, you know. People fast. I had a little fast. I had done not a drop to drink on New Year's. <laughs> no, no, I don't want to be one of these guys. I drink every other day of the year except New Year's. <laughs> so therefore, I'm pure. That is funny. That is a funny joke. But no, that's not the case either. I, I, um kind of allergic to, um, you know, alcohol, tobacco. It's weird. I've, I have an allergy. It's like a pure-hearted allergy. I really do. I have an, al I'm an allergic reaction in, in both. One triggers insulin, and, and I can't have that. And uh, the other one is uh, my lungs get clogged up so kind of easily, you know. And it's so even secondhand smoke can affect me in a way, you know. Uh, but I would borrow cigarettes from Trish and pretend that I wasn't smoking, but I was, you know, and so oh, maybe a couple of months ago, I, I, I uh, well, I finally, I was successful in stopping smoking, but the way I did it was Rob was here, uh, the studio designer, engineer, and producer, great guy to have met, you know, um, who really helped me learn a lot of things, but he was here, and he was turning the pots in my studio, you know, the knobs, knobs are pots, right, knobs. Okay, I'll just call them knobs, you know, volume, you know, whatever. And uh, they would make a crackling sound through the speakers. <laughs> like that. He said, I can tell you've been smoking in here, Zeph. Well, how do you know that? He turned the knobs. You hear that crackling? It happens on amplifiers. It happens on guitars. Okay? Connectors, when you plug your connector to your guitar in. Well, if you smoke, it's, you, you turn the pots on your guitar, it'll go <laughs> like that too. Because the smoke gets in there. So I, it freaked me out so much, I quit smoking. He, he scared me into stopping smoking. What, a, what an angel of God he was. And I just quit. I, I haven't told him this, but I just quit. I totally quit. And I keep turning the knobs and they're a little better, you know, not perfect, but I didn't. He said... When he worked in the studio system out in L.A., the, everybody would smoke in the studio, right? In the control room, mainly, you know? And in the control room, you have, like, a bank of all kinds of rack gear behind the console, and then you have the console, right? And then all kinds of monitors in there up on a shelves, and then you have a little window, and then you have the... It looks into the music room, right? You know, your tracking room and whatnot. So... All those pots, I mean, you've got hundreds of faders, you know what I mean? You've got t hundreds and a thousand knobs, right? Or thousands of knobs to turn. And it affects all of them. Even like behind the console, you have racks of 19-inch rack gear, like, you know, compressors and, you know, you know what I mean, and EQs and just all, tons of stuff back there. And it, all those knobs get affected too, not just at the console. All the little like treble EQ, all that stuff in like an SSL board, it, it corrupts the whole thing. So that's just cigarettes going on in there, right? And he would have to rebuild the pots when he was a you know, young whippersnapper, just starting out. He'd have to, you know, he was on the crew. To, he said, he'd, he'd say finally, I don't want to keep rebuilding these pots. You've got to smoke outside. Because the volume knobs, the faders, everything would start to make sounds which would get into the mix. All from smoking. And yet probably... In record making, you know, from mono, mono records to stereo records to, to five and 7.1 surround records, uh, basically, or, or CDs or DVDs, whatever, um, you know, smoking has been probably more, has been, more cigarettes have been consumed in the studio, in the tracking room, the music room, uh, you know, the guitar room, the piano room, the drum room, whatever. But the more, more cigarettes have been consumed in there and at the console than anywhere else because it gets it's when people sit at a console it gets anxi you get anxious you they smoke cigarettes and you know you have coffee and you you keep 
twisting the knobs and the faders, you're tracking people. Then you got to mix it down. And it's just all of that, you know, once you get, if you started with that habit of smoking, you know, behind your monitor screen, and that becomes like having a cigarette and a coffee and, 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 and pulling up to your console. And I've got a little, like a, kind of like a, a, cons- a floating console is what I have because I have all the same components as a console floating in rack gear. But it doesn't matter. It wrecks it all. So I freaked out. I quit. And I, for some reason, I go a long time, like I did this with, with dental, you know, until I learned that getting my teeth cleaned and, and getting my gums worked on and things like that have kept my teeth in great stead. That's why I'm, I'm still kind of, you know, and I use, uh, you know, but I mean, I, I used to just let it all go until it just got so bad it was terrible. And, you know, I had had root canals and everything because it got really bad, and now I don't have that problem anymore. They say, you can't have root canals. It's like, yes, I can, and I'm not sick from it. And so that's bunk, a lot of that. Yes, there's, there is evidence that possibly, you know, that bacteria leaks out and, and corrupts you, but I don't, I don't seem to have a problem with it. I know the symptoms, and I don't seem to have the symptoms that have been described. So, Well, maybe that's good. I don't have leaky crowns, but at least I saved the tooth. I got a leak. Yeah, they say you should have the tooth pulled out. And uh, I wasn't willing to do that. I went with modern science. Yes, the AMA. And uh, I kind of enjoyed it. The guy's like ripping my tooth apart. They leave a little sliver of something and then they put a crown over it. Anyway, I had those and those were my own fault. You know, my own fault because I let things go. And then I learned and then I haven't had a problem since. That's the way it is with me. It's like it's gotten that way with health. With, with, with all kinds of things, you know, one was smoking. I can tell you that when I, you know, I didn't smoke a lot, but I kept fooling myself thinking that, you know, if I was borrowing cigarettes from Trish, now Trish is her own woman. She's going to do what she's going to do. I don't, I don't, you smoke, if you smoke, that's fine. I don't, I know plenty of people that smoke. So, you know, don't think I'm telling you what to do. But for me, I had, I just, it freaked me out. I stopped it. But here, th- the news is this. It got stopped. It could have been just me getting into a cynical mindset. I stopped something, a habit I was doing. That's the point. It was no big deal. You know, and it saved having Rob come here to, or somebody to rebuild these pots, which I don't want to go through that. So I, I stopped. Uh, my lungs are doing pretty good, but I mean, they're, they're not what they were before. Indulge. It snuck up on me. You know, I admit it. I'd, you know, it's one cigarette here, it's one after dinner, and you know, who was I fooling? Eventually, it got to be a few a day, and then probably about eh, not a pack a day, but it was still enough to make to, that I could feel it that, that it was it was holding me back. Let's put it that way. So I didn't really like it. I quit. I don't like a lot of things that I'm doing, and I quit. And one thing I don't like that I'm doing is again cynicism. From the political, pro- from the discourse on the internet, on Twitter, just the meanness and division. And, you know, I feel that I have done the wrong thing. I feel I've tried to fight fire with fire, and I feel that I've done wrong, folks. I saw this thing last night. I was reminded how far off the mark I've been, but still. At least I know that. I can, I, can, I can quest for that mark now. I have no business speaking. I've, my business is in the spiritual realm. Not yelling at people for being corrupt politicians. That's like yelling at paint for drying on the wall. Not yelling at the world because it's so awful. That's the ultimate cliche, and that, that's, the, that's the guffaw laughter right there yelling at the world for being evil. That's like a guy with Tourette's syndrome yelling at cars for going by. You've seen that guy. No, they win, you see, once they, they make us cynical and once we start talking like uh, Adonza, it all sucks. We're just maggots on the earth in the sun feeding on the host until there's no host and then we die. Right? 
I think she used the term maggots. And he kept trying to save her. What was salvation for Cervantes? Salvation was the pureness of heart, which was called psychotic and crazy by the psychotics who were plotting and planning as psychopaths to take Cervantes' money, what, or, or the character that he was playing in Don Quixote, the character that became Don Quixote, who's not Cervantes. Cervantes is the author. But Cervantes created a character who was the uncle to this niece, who was the rich uncle, you know, who was a, was a, a gentleman, a, you know, a, a gentry in España. Dost thou comprehendeth? Need I go through it anymore? I mean, I hang around because we're just, we're friends, right? We're hanging around. I, you know, because once this recording ends, then you got to find something else to listen to, I understand, or whatever. Well, may this find you well. I pray in Jesus' name that each and every one of you uh, is encouraged and, in, and inspired. And if you happen to want to tune into any of those things like Don Quixote, Man of La Mancha, I'll, whatever version, I don't think it would hurt you if you look at it as an allegory of the quest for Christ. I think that's what Cervantes might have intended. But, you know, it, it, because all the virtues of this man that were laughed at and mocked. Really, I believe they were mocking Jesus all over again. Wouldn't you say that's true, Trish? Yeah. Okay. I think I'm on pretty good ground there. And with that, I bid you. <laughs> oh, gosh. I got to read you one more. Hebrews 10.22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Having our hearts sprinkled from, in other words, our hearts purified away from an evil conscience. Got me? I'm sorry the language is a little bit difficult, but let, let's try again. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance. As you draw near, in other words, could I put it in the Z language? Let us quest with a true heart, knowing that our hearts will be taken from evil conscience and our bodies will be purified as well. Bodies meaning our carnal uh, nature. May I say it that way? Okay, one more from James 127. Oh no, James 3, okay. Uh, 1 Peter one twenty two. seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the spirit into unfeigned, that means unfaked, love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Fervently. With a pure heart. That means agape. No games. Okay, 1 John 3.3, 3. and every man that is pure, this hope in him purifieth himself. Oh boy, that's really, really skewed. Let me try it in my own language. Every man who has this hope in Christ purifies himself. So the quest of Don Quixote for the truth, which is Jesus, purifies himself even as he is pure, even as the Lord is pure. Okay, said another way, the Lord is pure. If we quest after him, we become pure too. If it's even in your mind to, to run after him, he's already drawing you, so he's chosen you. So don't start thinking, I wonder if he's going to choose me. If he's in your mind or heart at all, he has.
Okay, here's another Don Quixote type of quote. 2 Timothy 2.22. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. I know a lot of Satanists quote the scriptures, so I've, I've tried to be judicious with mine. Well, here we go. We'll finish with the big one. It's Philippians 4.8, which you all know, but I'm going to do it again anyway. Finally, brother, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue... And if there be any praise, think on these things. Yes, well, be those things. Be truth, honesty, justice, loveliness, goodness, virtue, morals, respect for oneself and others, clinging to one's high purpose, Eschewing, pushing away those things of the world that are petty, gossipy, lusty, short-sighted, reactionary, angry, murderous, perverted, enslaving, harming, defiling. in the quest for the things that are pure, the things that are righteous, the things that are good, the things that are of honor and virtue, automatically one pushes those other things away because there's only room for one thing at a time. Either that, the world, or the pure. There's no room for both within the same vessel. It's the same as putting a wire between the positive and negative charge on your battery of your car. It would blow your car up. They cannot be contained in the same vessel. One must make a decision. Now I will go. And now I wish you good cheer.